him and may be recorded by other local media. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. <coughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us. We're going to begin the meeting with public comment. Is anyone here for public comment this evening? Please. Can I ask a public question? <laughs> <laughs> Why not? Come on up to the microphone, Absolutely. if you don't mind. We'll try to give you a public answer. I, and that's the only <laughs> answer I would want, so thank you. Uh, Jeff Stoltz, 2 Gillis Drive, North Reading. Um, so many of us are going to be here to with interest in the 20 Elm Street, and I did not know if there would be an opportunity during the 915 session for us to, to be able to be a part of that discussion. And that was my question. Uh, typically we do, if we have members in the audience that last that long, we do invite their participation. We will so, be there for you. Yes, I, I think it's more of an informational to, to bring us up to speed on everything that's transpired, bring, bring North Reading residents up to speed on everything that's transpired. So I, I don't think there'd be any opposition to having anyone participate publicly at that time. Just as long as everybody realizes this board doesn't decide that issue. Understood. Okay. Understood. But, you know, if it's being discussed, we were, yeah. we were curious mm -hmm. whether that we should be taking advantage of the public comment period or should we should be doing it to remain specifically to the, the, uh, for the, uh, uh, 20 Elm Street. And again, the discussion is Thank going you. to focus on the alternative that's been presented by the developer. Well, the 40B is part of a discussion, this is an alternative plan that we're looking to bring the entire board up to speed with. with. So I think it's more the focus is going to be on the alternative plan. In Understood. The, yeah. Yeah. Understood that we would also like to be able to comment on oh, the yeah. alternative plan. I'm sure. so, sounds, thank you very much. That I sounds good to me. I appreciate your very public <laughs> and outstanding <laughs> answer. Thank you all very much. All right, so that leaves us a little bit more. Is anyone else here for public comment that wants to speak now or? Okay. Then, then that brings us to the next item on the agenda, which is to hear from our auditor, Mr. Hingston, and our finance director, Liz Rourke. So. Good evening. Um, uh, as Madam Chair stated, we are here to discuss the FY18 annual audit results um, and review the financial statements as well as the management letter comments. Um, Dick uh, Hingston is here and he is our independent outside um, public accountant who does our annual audit for us and prepares the financial statements as well as the single audit and um, the uh, management letter. So quickly, I will be very brief. Um, the town uh, annually contracts with um, an independent certified public accountant for the purposes of auditing the town's accounts, funds, and preparing the financial statements as well as management letter. Um, the Massachusetts does not require um, annual audits of towns, but a town the size of North Reading, an annual audit would be required. So um, Mass General Law does not require an audit, but we, we have several reasons why we require an audit. One of those reasons would be that we expend greater than $750,000 in federal funds, and so that requires the single audit. Um, we also have greater um, uh, debt issuances, so that requires an audit as well. Um, and um, it, an audit is a good business practice to, to have done annually. So um, we just finished FY19, uh, that fiscal year closed June 30th. So uh, Mr. Hankson will begin that audit um, at some point between November and February. Um, and so that's why we are reviewing the FY18 audit. So it, it is always a, a year behind. So that's a brief synopsis on why we're here this evening. And I will now turn it over to Mr. Hankston. Thanks, Liz. Well, first, thank you for letting us do the audit again this year. We appreciate that. Um, if it, if anybody has any comments or questions, um, feel free to interject or ask any time. I really think these always work better if there's a conversation than a presentation. 
But I'm going to jump right into the management letter. Um, lately, there's been a lot of new standards in, uh, implemented, particularly as related to pensions and other post-employment benefits trusts, or o OPEB. Um, this year is no exception, and there was a major standard change re related to re what you need to report for your OPEB liability. Under previous standards, there was a phase-in amount of the net pension liability. And so you, would phase, you phased in the liability over a 30-year period. So as of June 30th, in the June 30th, 17 report, audited financial statements, we reported the net, the total liability that you had, the net li pension, OPEB liability, was $26 million more than what got reported in financial statements because of the phase-in requirement. This year, the phase-in went away, and the entire net OPEB liability had to be reported. So in the fiscal year 18 statements, we made a prior period adjustment of $26 million. Um, and the liability that's reported in the financial statements. So not in our favor, huh? Not, not the right, not the good way, no. <laughs> and so the, the, bad. the net pension liability reported in the financial statements is $62,965. Um, there's two key components. There's many assumptions, but there's two, two key components in the financial, in the, in the calculation by an actuary of that number. And if, if you don't, I have uh, a page in the audited financial statements that if you can turn to it, it's, it's good. Otherwise, I can just explain it to you. There's something called a sensitivity analysis that is required for the actuaries when they prepare their report. And we're required to put it in here, so just to show you how significant these assumptions are. So one of the assumptions is your discount rate. And you use the, the municipal bond rate, which is 3.87%. Had that gone 1% to the better, and it was 4.87%, your liability would have gone down by $9.8 million. And there's also another assumption that's called the health care trend rate. And the, the trend rate that they used in the actuarial report was 8% 8, 8 and then going down to an ultimate rate of 5%. So if you did 1% to the better on that too, the liability would have gone down $12.6 million. So those two key assumptions, if you went to 1% to the good on, the, on both of those, your liability would have, gone, would have been about $40.5 million instead of $60, $63 million. So it's, they're all sensitive to these assumptions. Um, you have the municipal bond rate because your OPEB trust is not what the, the actuaries and the standard setters consider significantly funded. Um, and so you're, you're going to be required to use the municipal bond rate until it's significantly funded. I can't tell you what that number is. That's more of an actuarial num um, number. But I can tell you that I have a, another town, I have some towns, but one of them has like $7 million in their OPEB trust. And they are considered significantly funded. And instead of the 3.87% interest rate, they're using 7%. So if you are significantly funded and had, I'm guessing you'd have to have over five million or so in there, then, then you, your liability, they'd use a 7% and your liability would be about $30 million less. So instead of 62, you, you're having $7 million or $5 million would make you look in the financial statements $30 million better. Excuse me, Dick, Madam Chair. Just yep. in the uh, comparative community, yeah. Is their liability similar to ours? Um, well, the, the total liability? Size community? I, I think um, they have a school. No, it's probably not. It's, it's probably small, smaller because. So that $7 million represents a significant. That's a significant amount for them. As opposed to $5 million, yeah. 62 with 7 on 40. Yeah. I, I don't know. It I, is. You know, okay, I'm just I trying know to you're going to ask that question, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just uh, curious as to Yeah. Me. No, I mean, they, they're, they're partially regionalized as a school. So that makes it smaller just by that, by that nature. So um, not, they're not fully regionalized, though. So just a high school, I think. So I mean, I, I know it's a difficult thing. But I think it's something that you should ask the actuary, you know, what, what's the minimum number that she would consider to make you significantly funded. 
Um, so I just wanted to kind of tell you about this, that OPEP part. The next part, next comment in there has to do with the OPEP trust. Um, in the fiscal year 18 budget included a $300,000 transfer to the OPEP trust fund. During fiscal year 18, the general ledger transfer was made, but the banking entry didn't get made till the beginning of 19. So we just recommend that that get made more timely. Um, you can get the money working for you sooner and, and get it into the, into the investment part of your, your cap. Your, portfolio. Um, if it's voted, if the transfer is voted at the annual town meeting, we recommend that you make the transfer on July 1st or July 2nd, right at the beginning of the year. If it's at a special town meeting at spring or fall, recommend that the transfer be made, the banking transfer be made uh, as soon as the minutes are certified by the clerk. Um, um, the next comment has to do with the investment earnings on the proceeds from the sale of land. Um, in fiscal year 18, as you all know, that the town received $19 million for the um, sale, sale of town-owned land. That right now resides in an account and er is earning in, uh, has earnings on investments. That the earnings on investment go to the general fund. So going forward, you're going to have about $400,000, ex in excess of $400,000 a year of earnings going into the general fund. So I just wanted to caution you to not become reliant on that $400,000 in your annual budget um, calculations. Because although this isn't one-time revenue, it's not forever revenue. That $19 million will eventually go away. Uh, I'm sure like most towns, that, that $19 million is a lot of money and it's a great thing for the town. But I'm sure that there's been many, it's been spent many times on the different projects that are, that are out there, you know, thinking that there would be good, good use of them. I believe I've been told that there already is a plan in place. Mike, is that true? There's a plan in place of we to wean off it? That's correct. As, as the revenues from the new project replace it. So I think that that's a good plan. And, um, but I, was, I, I would just suggest that once you finally do wean yourself off it and that's still getting that $400,000, I might suggest that you, at the end of the year, you look at what that was and what it contributed, because that's going to become part of your free cash in the years that you, you weaned off of it. Um, I suggest you might want to look at that, what it generated in free cash, and move it into a stabilization fund and only use it for something that's one time. So it's still, because if you became part of free cash and free cash kept growing and you used that for operating, that's the same as using the, the as, as a, so I would suggest that, or there's always the OPEP trust that you could put it into, so uh, make some contribution to that. But it's a really good thing that the town has getting that kind of, kind of money. Helps your financial position immensely. Um, the only other thing in here is there's two prior year's findings. One has to do with the investment policy, and another has to do with the ambulance accounts receivable. And I believe both of those are in process of being corrected. Um, that I think the investment there's a yes there's a, a joint, joint um, meeting group. They're, they're noted in the management letter as the town's response. Um, the town has a draft um, investment policy that we developed, the treasurer and myself, and the trust fund um, committee is also developing um, a draft policy as well. So. Um, so I'm just going to quickly talk about the financial statements. There, there's on the financial statements in the very first beginning of it. There's an opinion letter, and, and that's what the bond rating agencies look look at when they first get the um, financial statements. And they, there's a paragraph in there that says opinion. And so what they want to see is that the, fi the financial statements present fairly in all material respect, respects. As soon as they see that, and it's in that in a certain paragraph then they know that they can rely on the financial statements and they just move into the financial statements. Most of the other language in there is boilerplate and, and what standards we're following, what, whose responsibilities are, and, and, um, and, and, and other 
template type information. Um, the last four pages in the report have uh, reports that we issue that required um, based that report on your internal control and compliance with laws and regulations. And then there's a two-page report in the back, in the last two pages, that are on the same thing, internal control and compliance with laws and regulations related to federal grants only. And as Liz said, that's one of the big pushes on your, uh, that re is a audit, makes you have an audit requirement, is the Single Audit Act, and it says that anything over $750,000 in federal expenditures are required to have an audit. And there's certain reports that are, must be included with, within our audit report and certain testings that's required under the Single Audit Act. And there were no findings related to e on either side of that. Um, the only other page I'd just like to, if you don't, if you don't have it open now, it's something to look at in the future, is it's called the Budget Versus Actual, and it's required supplement, supplementary information. It's on page 62 of the report. This is what generates your free cash. So for those that do have it open, if you look on the far column, it says variance with the final budget. So there's a column that says the revenues and, and tells you what the original budgeted revenues were, the, the final budget, the actual, and there's a $1.7 million to the good on your, um, on your revenue side. And if you look up, it, you, you did extremely well in your excise tax, budget to actual, your $800,000, $880,000 over. That's pretty standard in Massachusetts municipalities. This year, it was a good year for motor vehicle excise. Uh, there, was a, there was a lot of revenues based on that. And then if you go down a little further, the same far column, it shows you what, how you closed out expenditures. And so it shows you some, some of the larger ones. There was the general government called, closed out $900,000, $993,000. I believe about 660 of that was the salary pool that didn't get carried forward in the prior year it had gotten carried forward when there was a contract um, negotiation pending and so this year it got closed out and then down down below in employee benefits there was an over nine hundred thousand dollars closed out and that was the employee health insurance about six hundred and fifty and Essex retire I mean Middlesex retirement of about a hundred and three thousand so you generated $4 million worth of free cash, and that's how you do it. You, you, you're conservative in your revenue estimates, and you come in over budget, and, and you don't just spend because you have money left in your budgets, and, and you close out appropriations, and that's what generates your free cash. Um, this was a good year for you. I think last year you generated about $1.6 million on this same report. And, and it shows in your free cash because this year, your uh, free cash was about $4,060,000, which was a 10-year high for you guys. So um, it's a good financial place for you right now, and the $19 million is going to help you going down the road. Um, um, I'm happy to answer any questions, and if, I, if, it, if, it, if it's time sensitive now, I'm happy to come in sometime and go over this with a lot more detail with anybody that would want me to. Mr. O'Leary. Just, uh, just a quick question, Dick. I don't know if it's going to be a quick answer. And, you know, we, we've been, uh, we, we've made, the board has made a conscious decision several years ago <clears throat> to chip away at the OPEP and basically uh, take care of our current liabilities moving forward. You know, there's as much we can do with, you know, 20 or 40 million dollars yeah. and catching up, but we okay. can, you know, stop the bleeding. Um, how does that factor into our bond rating and who do we have to discuss that with? Well, it, it definitely factors in. I mean, um, it didn't just appear to help us. Well, because it's, it's because of the significance of it. The, the more you contribute, the longer you contribute to it, the, the, the more it will help you. I mean, and, and at, at some point, if you can get to the point where you are considered significantly funded, then, then it's going to so like. That goes back down to the actuary. Right. To give, it, give us an idea. Right. If, so, if but it's going to be to. a time. It's going to take some time because it's. It's, you know, I'm saying it's, it's probably going to be up in the $5 million area. And, and then just that one thing alone, get to the place where they say, okay, you're significantly funded, they, the discount rate will fly up. And, and for each 1%, it's $10 million. Right, on that. But also, in addition to that, our cost of borrowing decreases. That's correct. You know, so it's, your it's a significant 
investment correct. that we're looking yeah. to so make. So it's not just in order to it's have not a, just to make your balance sheet look good. No, it's make, the, it, it, there's, reduce there's, your cost of borrowing. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, like the, the 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 places that I'm talking about that have seven and a half million dollars. You know, I have some others. They're they're all triple A communities, and and it's that's a significant part of it because they've they've spent a lot of time putting money into these OPEP trust funds. Okay, mm -hmm. and then just one other thing. This is in relation to the uh, the ambulance uh, fees. I was reading in the management letter that, um, and I don't remember the, recall us specifically saying that you know people get reported to the uh, credit agencies once we've exhausted it all and zeroed it out. I thought we weren't going to do that. You know, most of these people who are say delinquent are not paying the entire bill. Obviously, has experienced some sort of a hardship, um, and I didn't know that I didn't think that we were going to report them to the credit agency. So my understanding from the conversation that we had in, I think it was either July or August of last year, was that we would not be pursuing uh, further collection. So we're not referring them to any collection agent, uh, which is an option that's available to right. us, but we've been choosing not to do it. And instead, the sort of middle of the road to incentivize folks to either make the payment, file for an abatement, which is also a tool that's available to them, um, but for which most folks tend not to do for whatever reason because of the income restrictions. Um, or otherwise contact us, but that the, the sort of middle of the road approach was the report to uh, Experian, the credit agencies. Um, th that's where that was born from, and that's something that's been an option that's been available to the town and has been followed at various points in times um, uh, over the past, uh, I don't know how many years. So th that's where that comes from. We're certainly happy to revisit it. Um, I think if we're going to avoid taking that step, we're going to end up with the issue of the receivable being out there and growing into a larger number, and we would want to look at our policy more broadly in terms of how we're going to handle them um, before they get written off. Again, I don't disagree. Maybe at a, at a future date, Madam Chair, just uh, revisit you know the delinquency rate, you know how much are we really you know charging off, and uh, bring this matter back up. Just do we really want to be reporting? And again, maybe our policy can say that we may report it to a credit. You know, reporting agency as opposed to who will. Um, and again, that threat may assist in, in, in the collections. But I just read it with interest, that's all. Steve, it's a really hard receivable to collect because, oh, because there's no teeth in it. I mean, like, if you don't pay it, then you can't lien it, like, you can't report it to the Registry of Deeds. And if they don't live in town, you can't even, like, hold up a license or a permit for them. So if somebody get, gets driving through town, gets in an accident, it's, really, it's a really tough one to collect. No, oh, no, we know that. Yeah, and our, our, that's experience, why. Our, see, our experience is actually pretty good uh, overall in the collection. And I think the, the, yep. the procedures we have in place are, are good. And, you know, I think we utilize the requisite amount of resources yep. to glean the most out of it. I, I think my concern is, 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 you know, we're affecting people's credit. And, you know, some of them are scoff laws, but some of them are not. Yep. And I, I don't need to exacerbate the situations. And, uh, you know, maybe we should you know, just get that clarified a little bit more. Mr. Walner. I just, uh, I, I agree with what Steve said about what can we do to improve our rating, how can we better fund ourselves so we can reduce the cost of borrowing, a big deal for us. Um, I would also ask, and this is me catching up not knowing, um, on the proceeds from the Pulte property, the $19 million, okay. is it standard operating procedure that it goes to the general fund, or did you have choices about where that should go? Because I think yes, that's, it, it, that's a big deal. The, um, the $19 million goes into an account called this. It's called a sale of town only land account with any other proceeds that from previous sales. And the, the law, Mass General Law says, unless required to go elsewhere by law, then any earnings on investment goes to the general fund. Okay. So that's, no, there's yeah. really no choice. Though. Yeah, that's where we go. And, and, um, but you can so always After take the that fact, you step. can always target it for yep. whatever purposes yep. you'd like. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Sure. Any other questions? And I, I just had a quick question in terms of your comparison with those other communities and where they're AAA rated. How many other communities, I mean, there's a lot of, there's over 300 of us, how many do you think are in that echelon in terms of what they've been able to put aside for that liability? You know, I know that the ones that I'm talking about are, are like in the top 10 or so of the, of the communities in Massachusetts. I mean, they're in the... 10 to 15 so I mean I, I mean you have a million six a lot of towns have zero a lot of places have nothing put away so so uh, you guys have made 
you know, an effort, and, and they can tell that you're making, putting money aside, and it's not like you're just kind of ignoring it. Some places just don't put any money away. So, you know, I, I, can, I can probably get you better information. The DLS has, um, has some, a reporting uh, system that we can, I can go in and look up and get, find out what percentage you are. It hasn't been updated. I think it's, it's like based on 2016 or 2016 data. I don't think they've updated it for the last two year report. But it tells you, you can like look at it and tell you what percentage you were in of, a, um, of the 351 communities right at that point in time. I've been trying to get, I've been trying to see if, if they would have updated, but the last time I looked, which was, you know, months ago, it, it hadn't been updated for the more recent reports. Anyone else? Well, thank you. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks, Dick. Thanks, Liz. Thank you. All right. So we're moving on to our next order of business, which is a little bit late. Madam Chair, I move to jointly appoint Michael A. Prisco as a member to the Economic Development Committee for a term to expire March 3rd, 2020. Second. We have a motion to appoint Mr. Prisco. We have a second. Do we have any discussion? All those. So just, just, uh, this is just because they're swapping Actually, positions? Yeah, we'll That's correct. Are they swapping terms? Yeah, so we probably should have done <laughs> so first. Do, do we have Joe's the, first, yeah, right? I mean, so we, we um. had Joe's resignation? No, um, no. Oh. No. In the packet, it was explained that. Um, they look at a swap position. There's, Joe is swapping to associate, Michael is taking on a uh, regular oh. position. So I guess we're we're voting these out of order. It doesn't matter which way you vote. I don't think so argument. either. Yeah. So, so no one's leaving. They're just shifting their just switching positions. Okay. In the terms are, of staying with the seat rather than the individuals. Like Joe was was going 2020. It was going to expire in 2020. Yeah, and Michael's was going to be 2022. So now Joe's going to be 2022, and Michael's going to be 2020. Exactly. Gotcha. Right. Okay. Good. You got All right. So, good. so we draw in a. A roll call. Mr. O'Leary, do you have anything more to add? I do. I'm sorry, Madam Chair. So it is a joint vote. It's jointly voted by both the Select Board and the Planning Commission. I believe there is a quorum of the Planning here. Commission here. They're all present, yes. And you need a microphone when you vote. <laughs> all right. So um, motion. Any more, any more discussion? Mr. O'Leary? Aye. Mr. Walner? Aye. Mr. Schultz? Mr. Prisco? Ms. Gonzalez? Aye. And Mr. Prisco? So the second part of that vote is the vote of the CPC, which is here. CPC, yeah. So we are voting. This is the vote Mr. Prisco to take on the full-time position. You might need to just use a microphone so that the public can hear you. Because I can barely hear you. Thank you. We'll recognize the chair of the CPC. <laughs> Okay, so this vote is for the uh, is to um, uh, confirm uh, Mr. Prisco as the regular member of the EDC. So uh, I'll take a roll call vote, uh, Mr. Belvance. Aye. Aye. Dave. Aye. I'll say aye. Aye. Moving on to next order of business. Okay. Congratulations, Mr. Prisco. <laughs> this is coming to he's a okay. All right. So our next order is Madam Chair, I move to jointly appoint Joseph P. Lauria as an associate member to the Economic Development Committee for a term to expire May twentieth, twenty twenty two. Second. Again, this is just one member is shifting to associate, and we've just appointed Mr. Priska to a regular member. So I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All right. So we'll take a roll call. Mr. O'Leary? Aye. Mr. Walner? Aye. Mr. Schultz? Mr. Lurie. Mr. Gonzalez? 
Mrs. I mean, good <laughs> Lord, Mrs. I'm sorry. Everyone calls me Mr. Too. Uh, the chair. The chair votes Mr. Laria. And then we'll recognize. And we will take a roll call vote also. Aye. 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 My, and I vote aye also. That's All right. Okay. So now we're <laughs> moving on. to the next order of, of business on the agenda, which is our joint meeting with the Community Planning Commission and Economic Development Committee. We're gonna take up the review of the master plan and facility master plan. And we'll, Mr. Del Bierdo. Thank you, Madam Chair. I don't know if we wanna invite the Planning Commission and the EDC up to the to Both the tables, tables are available, They're so please available come for up and use. join us. It'll be easier for us to hear and communicate with you, too. Come take a seat in the front. And I think as we participate, there's a, I think one might, at this table that you can move back and forth, because we really can't hear unless we're micro we're using the microphone and I guess you're gonna have to borrow the one from the, How's the, view the over podium. There? Look different? Actually very unless you have a lot cooler. <laughs> Danielle, Danielle's gonna, 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 gonna be podium. using the podium. Can I get you to sign this? Oh sure. up Danielle if it's easier because we can barely hear you yeah it's not public at all <laughs> can you pick it up Danielle <laughs> there you go. if that's e yeah Take up the minutes. Yeah. <laughs> well, this yeah. is. A, do we have enough time to take up the minutes, Mr. Gilberto? I believe you may. All right. <laughs> All right. So let's skip around a little bit. Where are we going? We're going to go to item number thirteen, which are the. Um, excuse me. Item number twelve. which is a June 17th minutes. Madam Chair, I move to approve the June 17th, 2019 regular session minutes as written. Okay, that's in page 113 in chair file. And do I have a motion? Do I have a second? Second. Any discussion? Just wanted to clarify one thing on page three. For Jane, I guess. Um, it just says, under my thing, it says, Mr. Wallner stated the Elder Services identified IRP as a possible downtown area. That should be the um, Intergenerational Community Center, as opposed to IRP. That's it. I like it. So, 
So that's a basically that's a, amended. just a okay. Yeah, Scrivener's error. Scrivener's error. That will will be corrected. So all in favor of approval of the minutes as corrected. Aye. 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 I, I, I am noted as chairman in that, too, by the way. I'm assuming that's another Scrivener's error. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. I'm chairwoman, and then I'm chairman, so. <laughs> All right, next. Uh, Should we not assign <laughs> I'm not touching that. <laughs> Chair. Next, uh, the executive session. I move to approve the June 17, 2019 executive session. All right. Second. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Madam Chair, I was not present for the executive session, so I will be abstaining. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Four and one abstention. Abstain. Thank you. Danielle, you need a couple more minutes? Um, we're having problems getting the uh, connection to actually show the presentation. Water use water restrictions? restrictions? Um, Approve legal bills would definitely be. I think we could do legal bills, yeah. We get this stuff out of the way, we get out of here early Might tonight. Well. Yeah. <laughs> I could knock off 20 ohm real quick. I wouldn't have cut coffee. <laughs> All right, where are we going? Move to number 14 on the agenda. 14. Approve legal, legal bills. bills. Yes. Madam Chair, I move. Madam Chair, I move to rescind the vote of June 17, 2019 for the approval of legal bills and vote the following. to approve legal bills for April 2019 in the amount of $17,097.88 as follows. Copelman and Page, $8,941.88. Copelman and Page, Labor, $4,731. Arbitrator, Sarah Kerr Garrity, $3,000. American Arbitration Association, seventy-five. American Arbitration Association, 150. For a total of seventeen thousand ninety-seven eighty-eight. Uh, I have a motion. Do I have a second? second? Uh, the basis for that modification, rescission, and modification is one: the arbitration billing was listed twice on there in, in error. So that's the basis for the change. So I have a motion, a second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Unanimous. Danielle, I know that it's something you want to post, but two more legal bills. Two more legal bills. Go ahead. Go. Madam Chair, I move to approve legal bills for May 2019 in the amount of 15408 as follows. Copelman and Page General, 8150 Copelman and Page Labor, 7258 for a total of 15408 Second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Unanimous. Okay. Madam Chair, I move to approve legal bills for June 2019 in the amount of 14,910.51. As follows, Copelman and Page General, 8757.21. Copelman and Page Labor, 3325. Arbitrator, Sherry Rose Talmadge, 2008-2830. For a total of 14,910.51. Second. Motion and a second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Unanimous. All right. This is McKnight. Um, of the full study area that the Warren 
Thank you for your patience, everybody, as we address the technical difficulties. Here we go. For the, for the board to, it's, if you're going to look for it in the packet, it's at page 40, 47 in our share file. The warrant on. Thank you. I did. I don't know what it is in Dropbox. They shut it off. <laughs> at the bottom of the page. We're going to try one last time and then no, I'll just talk we'll about have it. to proceed without the yeah. technology. <laughs> I can discuss while we're waiting for you to call this up that the purpose, at least one of the purposes behind this joint session um, had to do with the discussion that we had last meeting with the board and it pertained to the $50,000 wastewater study that was approved at town meeting, the October 2018 town meeting. It was on warrant articles for the town meeting. And as originally proposed, it was now that you have it, now that you have it up, we have the study area as originally proposed. It was to be studied, utilizing those fifty thousand dollars in funds. And in last meeting, what was presented to the board was to utilize those funds for a specific focus on one parcel. And um, the CPC seeking our direction with respect to utilizing that fifty thousand dollars on one parcel. And at, after everybody left, we kind of revisited the issue of that discussion and thought it would be better held with both the EDC and the CPC and uh, in this joint setting for some further detail on that, considering utilizing the fund on that one specific parcel versus the entire um, study area that you're, you're calling up on the screen. So. So actually, this, this still would be the study area for what we would like to do. Um, so I'm sorry if it wasn't clear the last time we were here. Um, the intent was to actually do the study um, as originally proposed, but um, there would that study includes the 66 Winter Street parcel. Um, so I just wanted to kind of give an overview of um, what it is the CPC is looking to do, how 66 Winter Street ties into that, and um, how the scope of the study um, has evolved a little bit, but we think is essentially the same. So I'll, I'll just go ahead. Um, so to address some of the questions that came up last time, um, this is an illustration of the full study area that the warrant article refers to, um, as defined by the 2015 MAPC Economic Development Report. <coughs> It includes 66 Winter Street, um, but the intent is to look at the whole district as originally intended and to come up with the conceptual design scenario and master plan for that whole district, but to be phased. Um, 66 Winter Street being the property that's currently available would be pre presumably the first property targeted for actual changes, but the study itself would look at the whole district because we're not sure we could do much with just one property. Um, 
So just to review how the CPC um, arrived at focusing on that area of town, I'll, I'll go over three recent studies that have examined this area. The 2015 Economic Development Report, which I just referred to, um, the Mass Downtown Initiative uh, Streetscape Study, uh, which looked at getting a better streetscape and more walkable, attractive downtown area uh, through the redesign of that part of Main Street and the recommendations um, for the, from the draft master plan, um, which is soon to be released. The um, economic development report um, looked at that study area in previously shown. Um, it included a market analysis, which showed that if sewerage were available, this part of town could have, and the market could absorb, an additional 43,000 square feet of retail space, um, including 10 stores and six restaurants. The market for office space was, was shown to be limited. Um, the housing market analysis showed the area could absorb 130 to 172 housing units. and. Um, and this just paints a picture of an area that could accommodate some, but not huge commercial development and would be largely limited to retail, um, and if the town chose, housing. Um, attracting private development to this area is a challenge and one that could be addressed by introducing a wastewater solution, um, rezoning to allow for housing, and considering adding a civic or municipal use that would draw people uh, to the area and establish th the district as a node of activity. The concept was to use uh, public investment to leverage private investment. Um, there was feedback from a public forum after this recommendation was made in the 2015 report, um, which was supported. Um, that concept was supported. Um, the report's recommendations included um, c contemplating an outdoor park or plaza along with an assembly space, such as a senior or, cu or cultural center or a town hall. Um, <coughs> and this was thought to be um, a solution for addressing the problems of attracting development to the area while also responding to the frequent feedback that the town lacks a commercial center that has a public gathering space, which together would contribute to a downtown feel. Um, the lack of a recognizable social gathering space um, or a landmark along Main Street was frequently recognized as a problem um, in the course of, of doing this study. The town center um, could have served this function, but it's largely not developable uh, due to environmental and historic constraints, and it lacks the concentration of retail needed to work this way. Um, the town hall's current location was viewed as problematic, both for access and because it could not be used to bring foot traffic to a district that could use a destination to support retail. This recommendation was intended to address uh, both an economic issue and a social and lifestyle issue. Um, also, uh, that report uh, prioritizes development within that study area, um, which was broken down into blocks. Residents were asked which they would like to see redeveloped first. Input from the community meeting and working group um, that we used to help us guide the study indicated a strong preference for prioritizing block nine, which is the former stop and shop, along with blocks six, which were 66 and 68 Winter Street, and 11, the postal facility, uh, rated next. So as a result, the, the CPC came up with a, a slightly smaller, more refined study area based on those blocks to look at for its, some of its future efforts. Um, and that included um, the original scope of this warrant article study um, that they originally wanted to do. Uh, they had narrowed it down to about 10 properties. Um, and also, uh, that was the basis for the rezoning effort that would take place a couple of years later that, that rezoned a portion of Main Street, um, which I will say a little bit more about. Uh, in a few minutes. Um, also that same year uh, that the economic development study was done, um, the, CT the CPC completed its Mass Downtown uh, Development, um, sorry, Mass Downtown Initiative uh, plan, which was um, a streetscape improvement plan uh, for Main Street. And again, the same general study er area was used as a basis for the plan. And this plan contained recommendations for improving the look and function of that stretch of Main Street of, uh, between the two intersections at Route 62. Um, and again, essentially, it was, it was the same study area that we used. And just to take kind of a closer look at that, um, this bottom graphic shows the whole study area that we used for the, um, this study, and then the top shows some of the areas that they focused in on, which were the intersection of Winter Street and Main. Now the draft uh, master plan recommendations, um, and the draft master plan should be released very soon. We're working out a final, uh, a final draft to be distributed for public um, comment. Um, similarly, the master plan that is now in progress addresses a more centrally located uh, town facility. Um, and the vision section in that draft plan contains um, several overall big ideas, and one of them is um, 
leaving a legacy for future generations that could include a recognizable and walkable town center shopping village and enhanced town facilities such as centrally re relocated town hall with potentially integrated senior and community center or a new town square. Um, and I'll read also this excerpt from the draft uh, master plan um, from its economic development chapter. Um, <clears throat> There's another type of physical improvement that could further catalyze and transform Main Street beyond sidewalks, slower traffic, reduced curb cut distances, attractive crosswalks and bike lanes, a potential town decision to create a civic, non-retail oriented square near retail development. Um, it, it goes on to note that the town hall is located separate from other civic um, and town functions, um, and that if the town and community were interested in creating a there there along Main Street, um, the town should consider the sale of another town-owned property to support the purchase of a site with frontage along Main Street or one that could be part of a multi-property development uh, with access to Main Street. Ideally, a relocated um, town hall right on Main Street would include carving out a signature pocket park or a hardscaped uh, town square or plaza that would highlight the new town's um, main hall facade and front entrance. Um, it would be contemplated as a highly transformative project um, that would serve existing residents and leave a legacy for the future. Um, town hall relocation could also involve um, including and consolidating other town uh, functions such as a senior center or multi-generational uh, youth senior center. Uh, beyond visually marketing the Main Street landscape with a recognizable village or town center, both nearby uses and new town hall visitors and workers could bring more foot traffic and activity to each other. In this scenario, there could be multiple opportunities for nearby shoppers, town hall visitors, and um, seniors and youth community center visitors to move to and from uh, the new indoor and outdoor facilities. And that's just kind of taken right from, from the draft plan. Um, and then, now just to return to the use of the warrant article funds um, from Article 10 from October 2016, that article refers to recommendations from the MAPC study and cites the study area. That full study area includes 44 parcels and 97 acres. Um, and out of necessity, the most focused study of this might need to narrow down the area based on how that study prioritized development. Um, though the work can provide an overview uh, concept plan for redevelopment of the whole area as originally defined. We would not want to narrow it down so much that the whole study was about the one property, um, but we would include the one property as, as the larger, um, as part of the larger plan. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> the way the article um, is phrased, um, it's, is a redevelopment concept plan, including but not limited to wastewater treatment options for a section of Route 28 in the vicinity of Route 62 in accordance with recommendations made in the land use and economic development study performed by Metropolitan Area Planning Council completed in 2015. The purpose of the study was twofold. Um, one, looking at shared wastewater treatment plant feasibility, and two, a redevelopment concept plan, including design scenarios for a study area analyzed in that 2015 um, economic development report. The need to look at wastewater as part of a redevelopment concept plan has evolved, but it still exists. Um, the focus of this aspect of the study would not be on package plant feasibility as an end result, but on how sewerage could enable development and how package treatment could act as an interim step if necessary. Municipal sewer um, is anticipated for the future if, upcoming su if, if the upcoming sewer study um, shows that this is many years away, a package plant would be a temporary solution. Any package plant would need to be designed uh, so that the infrastructure could be adapted to future municipal sewer connection because that is our ultimate goal. Um, and if the upcoming sewer study shows that municipal sewer really is very imminent, um, this aspect of the study, the package plant feasibility, um, does not need to be done. Due to that very large size of the study area, um, the CPC had decided to prioritize the smaller areas to target for wastewater and certain zoning recommendations, as I had mentioned earlier. Um, the MAPC report indicated several blocks were a higher priority for redeveloping, um, but they needed to stay uh, within a contiguous area if we were looking at package treatment. So um, they also included the car wash and mobile home sites. Um, the study recommended looking at whether a municipal use such as a town hall or a community and senior center could be a component of um, the target area's redevelopment. The CPC focused on 10 properties um, east <coughs> excuse me, of the 62 intersection, and these 10 properties became the target of the zoning, uh, rezoning warrant article in June 2017 to allow for mixed use as a component of mixed use development. So this here you'll see was the original uh, target area for that zoning area, that zoning overlay. 
Um, all the properties were rezoned, um, with the exception of Stop and Shop, um, which was removed. There were there were concerns that the select board had at the time um, about including such a large property in this kind of an effort. The area coincides with those 10 properties, um, including Stop and Shop, that, are, um, that were also originally targeted for the wastewater and redevelopment study. Um, an RFP for that wastewater study was developed, but it was placed on hold, as you know, as sewer uh, began moving forward. That smaller pilot area was um, <clears throat> defined to begin, but the intent was uh, to expand uh, the full study area and potentially all of Main Street if it was successful. Um, <clears throat> so right now, what the CPC would like to do is <clears throat> to pursue a, co a conceptual redevelopment plan for the study area um, as a partner in the plan or to provide guidance for any other developers of the area. Um, they want to do the, the plan that includes 66 Winter Street and the Ocean Shut Ocean State job lot parcel, but really do the whole, the whole study area. Contemplate phasing the development plan so that it incorporates each property as it becomes available, um, which would mean private redevelopment for most of the properties. Um, to begin with 66 Winter Street, since the owner is ready to uh, redevelop or sell to the town to have developed, uh, but the full study is to address the complete study area. Um, Part of the study would be determining whether package treatment is necessary at all for this area, and if so, how the infrastructure would be adapted for municipal sewer when that became a reality. If package treatment is needed to develop a shared system feasibility plan for those private property owners, and potentially the town, if the town wanted to become an owner, to use the redevelopment plan as an incentive for other private property owners to take action on investing in or redeveloping their property and to demonstrate what a redevelopment could look like that includes a town facility. The scope of the study would remain the same, but place greater emphasis on the concept plan and design scenarios and less emphasis on package treatment as um, a long-term solution. Both would still be examined and addressed in the study per the parameters of the warrant article. Package treatment would still be addressed, but assumed to be a temporary measure, could be to be converted to a more permanent sewer solution, depending on what the sewer study reveals this fall. Um, and to follow the MAPC study recommendation to explore placement of a municipal building such as town hall or community senior center or other civic use as part of a redevelopment scenario in this target area. So that is the update on, and, and some of the questions and information we think we did not actually provide to you the last time we were here. I realize we did not give the most complete picture of what the CPC wanted to do when we were here last. Um, so. Right, so just just at the outset, it, I, I think it was presented that you wanted to shift the utilizing of this funds from that entire area and the purpose behind it to focusing specifically on Mr. Heffron's parcel and a redevelopment of his parcel or a conceptual redevelopment of his parcel. And that was really why you were before the board last month to ask if, or to uh, explain that that you felt that was within the parameters of the warrant, or the CPC felt that that was within the parameters of the warrant article. So with that in mind, and this sort of expanded presentation saying now it's gonna be the same study area, but we're gonna start with Mr. Heffron's parcel. I'll first turn to members of the board to see if they have any questions for you. Um, Mr. Schultz. Yeah, we, I spoke with this last meeting, but I'm still troubled with the fact that I realize now it's a bigger scope, but we're kind of doing this for Mr. Heffron's property is what I'm hearing is the main target of this and the stop and shop property. And a few things I would say on that. We don't own those parcels. We should not be developing privately held parcels. That I, I see other business owners in the, in the gallery here tonight. I think they would like their, the town to analyze their properties too. Why are we just singling these two out? That's my first question. The other issue is if we are interested in, in developing these properties, well, by us doing this big study and saying, well, all these great things we can put on it, we just raised the price of acquisition on those properties. The other thing I don't understand, and I'd like to get the EDC's feedback on this part, is putting municipal buildings in prime commercial areas, one takes them off the tax rolls and stymies commercial growth. I, I don't know if the EDC has discussed that issue, or I, I think you guys should have been here at the last meeting, but you're here tonight. I just don't know why we want to take the, the most prime piece of commercial property that we have and make it, take it off the tax rolls and make it a municipal building. It just doesn't sound like good development to me. Thank you, Mr. Schultz. So I think the reason why we called this joint hearing is because both of these boards have been independently working on this for years at this point. So I think it's more of a joint kind of interpretation and review that's required. And, you know, as Mr. Schultz has mentioned, if there's any input 
that we can have or the general public can have regarding use of this or this further studying and this redevelopment proposal. That's why I think the joint meeting is important. So um, if, if anyone else, Mr. Mr. I'll, just, I'll just start off by saying I think from our last meeting, I didn't take away that the intent was to focus on that one particular property. What you described is what I always had in mind as being what they were, that article. If we read the article and read what it says, it's very much about 62, uh, 28, and it's about how wastewater fits into that. And that, that I think, was the entire scope. It just happened to be that the 66 winter property has you know, raised their hand, but I don't think it's at all intended to be just about that property. It really has to look at the whole thing. I would say, though, within, that, with that, within saying that, the wastewater package treatment plant can only reach so far. It's not going to reach the upper ends, edges of, of that total area that you talked about. So I think, in general, it's going to be geographically very close to each other. So I think it's going to be limited in scope at the end of the day, just by the fact of what the treatment plant can actually cover. So, Sean Delaney, a member of the EDC. So, I'll give you the history from the EDC perspective. And I have a number of members here, correct me if I'm, I'm wrong on this, but it was about two, two and a half months ago, we were invited to a meeting with CPC where Mr. Heffron had come in to that meeting and he at least presented a conceptual idea, I don't know how much of a plan that he had about his own development of that particular parcel at 62 Winter Street where he had some photos of existing buildings in Wilmington that he met with a developer that he knows that developed these buildings in Wilmington. Multi-story structures, I think they all had three, minimum of three stories where he proposed putting in retail, office space, and residential. The photos he showed looked like it was tremendous. So I don't know if, if there's a private developer out there, a private owner looking to develop his land, why would we want to interfere with that from an economic development perspective. I don't think there's a reason for us may to interfere with that. May I respond? I, I'm not done. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I thought you were asking a question. <laughs> so that's, that's how it came to the attention of the EDC. So the EDC hasn't been working on this for years. That's when it first came to us. And I know that there was a meeting with CPC and this board uh, at your last meeting. I'm just unclear as to what the purpose of tonight's meeting is specifically about. I watched some of that meeting, and that discussion went on for hours. So I'm a little unclear. So I, I guess I need clarification from my committee as to what the ask is tonight. Is it simply taking the $50,000 that was allocated under that warrant article and do a further study on what possibilities there are there for that designated area? for wastewater treatment plant? Is that the ask tonight, or is this? I don't think it's exactly the ask tonight. I think um, we, part of our discussion, we wanted to clarify, because I don't think that we were clear um, when we were last here discussing um, wanting to go ahead with spending the Warren article money. I think we did leave the impression that it was about just 66 Winter Street, because that was a big topic that was of concern, and one of the reasons why we want to look at, you know, make sure we're looking at this area. Um, <clears throat> I, that is that is a discussion that the CPC and the select board have 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 been having, and we wanted to hopefully come to an endpoint on that discussion. Um, but the other purpose I think for our discussion tonight has to do with, in general, the future of 66 Winter Street and. Uh, is there agreement on the concept that if there is a good municipal use um, for that part of town, whether it's 66 Winter Street or some other property in that part of town, if there's general agreement with that idea, then there's the concern that there's a, an RFP going out for the facilities master plan, and that facilities master plan should probably contemplate the things that, that the community master plan is, is recommending. If the feedback is there's, there's really no feeling at all that, that there should be any municipal use pursued for that area of Main Street, I think that will affect the parameters of the RFP that that group is working on. So that's one, I think, really important point that everyone wanted to get out of tonight. Um, Okay. So, from the EDC perspective, although we haven't taken a formal vote, mm -hmm. uh, I think the overall consensus is that that area is more conducive to private development than town-owned and town-developed 
I don't, just, I don't view the town as a developer, or I shouldn't say me, but the consensus of the committee is the town's not a developer, per se. And what I've heard discussed through members of the CPC is that the town could come in, put some municipal use, but also do some sort of commercial, residential, or retail down in that area. Um, conceptually, I don't know how that works. So I think uh, what we would, uh, I don't know that it would work so much as the town being a developer. I, I think it would work something like the way the Pulte property was developed, where the town sets the parameters, has a concept that it wants, goes out and, and finds a developer who could <coughs> achieve that. If there's a municipal use involved in that, then that would be part of the direction. That's how I would envision that happening. I don't know for sure that that's what everybody would want to do. Um, but I think also in response to the idea that the that part of town should be exclusively for commercial de development, which may be, if that's the overall feeling, then, you know, that's probably something, you know, we should, we should be talking about and considering going forward. Um, I think one of the reasons that those previous studies the CPC had done actually even mentioned having municipal uses there is because the potential for development in that part of town is not extremely large. There's, there's, the market could absorb some retail and it can absorb some restaurants. It has no market for office at all. Um, and I think that the idea of bringing in something could actually try to enhance some of the other uses that we do want to get. Now, I haven't done a study, you know, we haven't done a study specifically determining what the financial benefits would be of, of introducing a use like that. But the theory is that that could happen. So I think that's where that idea comes from. <coughs> Mr. Walner? Yeah, there's, there's um, you don't really have to go too far to look at where people have built up communities to find that they're always bringing in an element that is not just commercial. If all you do is just build commercial, it, it sounds great, it sounds like a lot of revenue, but people don't show up. Um, you need to give them something more. So I work downtown, right outside my office is a beautiful park sitting in the most expensive rent in all of Boston. And the reason why that park is there is because people come out, they want to interact, it keeps the buzz going, there's a lot of activities going. If you go to Linfield Market Common, there's a skating rink in the summer, I mean in the winter, not in the summer, uh, in the winter, and you know they're doing yoga and exercise out during the day. If you go down to Stoneham, they're doing farmer's market during the summer, they're doing it right downtown there, and they're doing the skating rink. You need to, if you want to create a there there, which is a very important concept to get people in there, you have to give them something. Whether it's municipal, whether it's a theater, whether it's a farmer market, you have to give them something to draw them in as opposed to just opening up shops. Um, so I think that's just a very important thing that we need to know. Um, anyway, sorry, I'll probably have something else to say, but I'll stop there. Mr. Prisco. Excuse me. Michael Prisco, member of, <coughs> member of the EDC. I need just a little understanding before we go off into this discussion a little bit more. You know, October 2017, we went to town meeting, water, wastewater. And when we presented to the town meeting, we had the pros and the cons in there. And one of the cons associated with that direction and all that money that we got approval was to keep water and wastewater together, going to the DEIR. And one of the biggest things was that Andover was committed to help us get connected, connected to the Greater Lawrence Sewer District. We actually had a plan to bring sewage in. I applaud everyone's vision on what they want Route 28 to become in 62. And we all know it does stem on wastewater. And if we're not going to be patient to get the wastewater to town line and going out and spending this money on these plants for the short term, to me, seems like a huge risk. Because now you're going to have people spending lots of money on these very expensive facilities that actually have to be maintained. And then to mothball them and then to clean that area becomes a hazardous issue. I just think, can we, can we just get a little update? I think it would be helpful for the EDC is, are we still on track to work cooperatively with Andover to get that pipe to town line? Because we have the $20 million. When I left the board several months ago, it was still the plan to give that money to Andover to get the pipe to town line, and then we'll figure everything else as we go along. So if you could just help me out there, and then you can allow someone else to talk. <coughs> I know our board members are still actively, I know you want to speak, Mr. Walner, but that did actually come up last month, and our, 
our our TA and our board members are still actively in the process of those negotiations with Andover in the midst of permitting. That did actually come up, and I don't know if one of our um, board members would like to give a little bit more information or edification, but as it came up last month, that was still actively being, we were still actively engaged with Andover and pushing forward with that, so. Mr. O'Leary. Not much has changed in the last few months since you've left, Michael. Um, particularly the uh, slow progress, shall we say, uh, with, with, with the town of Andover. I mean, we have had, uh, of course, Andover had, a, had an occurrence, you know, a few months ago where they were a little bit distracted uh, by uh, the uh, gas explosions up there so that you know, it was understandable that they weren't able to uh, commit uh, necessary resources uh, to assist us even further on the wastewater. Uh, we're still focused on water with Andover. We still have to get the uh, uh, FEIR filed. Uh, they have a, a lot of hoops to jump through and a lot of questions to answer, uh, which is going to take them several months, I would expect. Uh, they're going to focus on water. Their focus is not on wastewater, and they've told us at this particular point in time, water is their you know, key approach, and that's what they have to address. So as far as, you know, how far are we along in relation to, um, you know, getting Greater Lawrence sewer to the to the town line? Uh, we're no further along today than we were six months or almost a year ago. Uh, to be honest with you, uh, the interest is still there. We still are pressing uh, Andover to assist us um, with the uh, technical support that we're going to need from them. We have our consultants uh, finally talking with their consultants about things, uh, but but it's going to be a long painstaking process in order to uh, to get the uh, the dollars and cents associated with what it's going to cost exactly uh, what type of, uh, what kind of conditions their system is in and what upgrades are going to be required we have a preliminary number uh, but again that's our consultants as best estimate not with any input from theirs so uh, we're trying to get the two parties connected again their focus is, is on getting the uh, uh, the water uh, situation finalized and uh, that's where the priority has to stay at this particular point in time. So it's going to be slow uh, and, and it's much slower than we want it to be. <laughs> it's much slower than uh, I anticipated it to be. Um, but then again, we know how our relationship has been with them in the past and things have not moved along quickly at any step of the, of the way. But again, we're grateful for their commitment, we believe, has not changed, you know, because it's part of the uh, the long-term 99-year deal, you know, they committed to uh, supporting us um, in our effort to join into Greater Lawrence Sewer. So I don't believe their support has waned. Uh, they're just, their interests and their priorities uh, are not the same as ours at this particular point in time. Mr. Tony. From the EDC perspective, some questions that I think most of the members had in terms of, I think one was answered, somewhat answered, uh, in terms of the acquisition cost. I don't know if that's a definitive number, Warren, that you had put out there from Mr. Heffron, but my understanding is the acquisition cost of the property is somewhere in the range of $2 million for a parcel that's just over two acres. Is that correct? I would rather Mr. Uh, Heffron gave you the answer to that because he, he there were some numbers that were, that were uh, put out there primarily having to do with someone else taking the property um, and using it essentially the same way it's being used right now. Okay, uh, so so if we, so I guess the, from EDC perspective, we don't know what the acquisition cost is. We're sort of doing this backwards. It's the cat before the horse. We don't know what the acquis acquisition cost is. Then there's, I would imagine, cleanup costs associated with the site. My understanding is the site was used to maintain and service heavy equipment for the Heffron business. So I, do, I would imagine that the soil is somewhat. Uh, all right, well, I know why you're shaking your head, but uh, I don't know how you know that until. Oh, well, because the 21 E has already been done. He okay. has it to complete right, 21 that's, E. That's news. Yeah. And also there's demolition costs associated with it. Because I would imagine the town, if the town were to purchase it, mm -hmm. the town is not going to use it as is, this demolition cost. And I know we don't have the answers to those questions. So I guess we're a little premature if we don't know what the asking price is for the property, what the demolition cost would be for the property, 
yes, the town's sitting on $19 million, but I think that $19 million would be best to either hold on to and use for storage, which would greatly enhance this entire community, versus spending millions of dollars, one, to acquire, two, to demo the property, before you even put a shovel in the ground to construct whatever medicinal property would go there. I would imagine most of that $19 million would be eaten away at just doing that. So I just think we're premature, caught before the horse, asking to do these studies and also whether or not the town, if the EDC has an opinion as to whether or not that's an appropriate site for municipal use. I think there's more questions than there are answers so far that we've heard. So that's what I have to say up to this point. Madam Chairman? If I, if I may. Um, over the years, we've done, there's been many studies done, I think starting back in 93, 94, We've done many, many studies, and as Danielle alluded to in her presentation, every one of them uh, recommended that we produce some kind of a town center, that we create for the town something, uh, a legacy, they call it. And this particular location generally came up every single time. If I were to add up the amount of money that we spent with all these studies, including the MAPC and everybody else, probably enough to buy the property when every one of them came up with the same recommendation. So unless we have somebody that's more knowledgeable than these experts that we've hired all these years to produce for us these particular recommendations, then uh, I don't know what we, what, what we would do. Also, it's clear that that particular property will not progress in, in any real way. That it, it, it's more likely that it would get turned over to another pr property owner who would not produce those, those properties, who would in fact most likely continue to use it the way it's being used, because it does have a value there. But without some kind of development there, you're not, there's never going to be the kind of growth or the ki kind of economic growth that you think might happen there. So, so then it just causes me to have another question. So then what Mr. Heffron came in and conceptually presented to you was then just a dog and pony show. What he brought in was pictures from another town right, as a possibility. Right, but he presented it. I was there for that entire meeting. He presented as though this was his idea and what he wanted to do and have a legacy for his father. Legacy. Mm -hmm. Right? So, but now you're telling me that no, and I know you've had other discussions with him outside of probably another meeting or whatever, but it sounds like his intent if the town doesn't purchase the property from him or some sort of <coughs> lease, long-term lease from him of the property, then his intention will turn it over to another sort of asphalt company. He presented to me a number of different possibilities. He did not focus on any one of them. He gave us, and you heard his preferences, he was quite clear what his preference was, quite clear. and. It seemed to be uh, the kind of situation that was, that was perfect for the town. Basically, that location, again, has been pointed out in, in, in uh, every one of the studies that we've ever had done. Uh, and he agreed with it, that it would be a good thing, and he was willing to, uh, I think he's willing to, to help out with it. I think he has, I don't, in other words, I don't know, he made his intents very clear. He was clear about the fact that he wanted to leave a legacy. And that was more valuable to him than the money. And so to look that, to overlook that, especially in view of the the fact that we have spent large sums of money uh, to, on experts and on uh, studies that came up with the same conclusion pretty much every time, and to overlook that and, and second guess that, I'm not sure if that's the right thing for the town to do. And if we end up losing that property and never having another opportunity such as that to do a town center in a location that it couldn't be more prime, um, then perhaps we'll look back at that and, and, and wonder why we didn't do it. Mr. Waller? Yes. Um, uh, I, I think we have to stop talking about 66 Winter Street. We have to talk about that area. 
This is about that area. 66 Winter Street just happens to be a part of that area. And nicely he's raised his hand, he says he wants to work with us. But that's the last time we should ever talk about that. Nobody's, I'm not suggesting we spend money on anything until we have a plan. And what CPC is asked for, the last time they came to see us, they wanted to let us know that they were ready to exercise the 50,000, they were ready to put in place what we had voted for, the town had voted for, a good year, a year and a half ago, to spend $50,000 to come up with a plan, a development plan for the 6228 area combined with a wastewater plant sewage plant. Because no one has any idea when the sewage is coming through. I've heard three years, I've heard 13 years, I've heard 20 years, I've heard never. We don't know the answer to that question. That is something that has to be studied. There's no doubt about that. We can't make a decision on any of this until we have a plan about how we're gonna do downtown, until we've done our facilities master plan. We have to have that information here. And we also have to have the sewage information here. And all of that's gonna to come together probably in front of this board. And then we're gonna to have to try to figure out how do you look at all these competing objectives and come up with the synergy to make these objectives work together. Because we're never gonna be able to pay for everything. So we have to work on all three initiatives. I'm assuming the schools, which is part of the facilities master plan, will not become a, a compelling issue. I think it's just gonna come down to sewage, downtown, and uh, facilities. We have all that information. There's gonna have to be an implementation plan that's smart, that makes sense over a period of time, and that the board will have to come up with synergy so that they all work together as most efficiently as possible. And the town has definitely, Warren's right, the town survey is very compelling. They want to see something happen here, and they do want a downtown civic center. And unfortunately, our current old town doesn't quite do that. It does it for a population of our, of our town, but doesn't do it for everybody. And I actually am gonna go further to say that I think the select board at some point should be taking a leadership role in trying to bring this all together. Um, because everybody has their silos, everybody's working in their best capacity possible. It's no fault of anybody else, but at some point, we gotta get this vision all put together and I think we should have a role in not just be waiting for the information to come to us. We should actually take a lead role in doing this. So I, I know Mrs. Schultz, then Mr. O'Leary, then Mrs. Gonzalez all want, Mrs. Gonzalez. Thank you. <laughs> all want it. Um, to have some input, but I think part of the reason why we have everybody here is because of that reason. So trying to get everybody on the same page here as to what this is. And I do think, I agree with you, but I do think what was presented is it was, a, was a sheet directly <coughs> focusing on the redevelopment of 66 Winter Street. And there's really no, it's in writing. I, I, don't, so see, I don't see that sheet. It was presented to us at the last meeting as the handout oh, on this topic. Okay. I don't remember so that sheet. Okay. I think that's why we need all of these yeah. silos in the same room and that's why they're here tonight. So that before we move forward with this, we're all we are all on the same page with it. So um, Mr. Schultz. Yeah, I, a couple of things that I just disagree respectfully with my colleagues on I keep hearing about these town surveys and residents want X, Y, and Z here. Well yeah, if you ask a resident, would you like a nice town area right here? They're gonna say yes. But when you say, but you're going to have an override to get that, okay, how are you going to pay for these things, number one? As Mr. Delaney correctly said a few minutes ago, we have a certain set of money we have set aside from the sale of the J.T. Berry property. Once that's gone, it's gone. It's kind of like the Cadbury eggs. You know, it's, we're done. We get one shot to do this right. The studies that we've had for years, yeah, have said the same thing. It said that the lack of a wastewater solution is what's is really it's, it, hampering commercial growth. We all know that. But now we have a viable wastewater solution, and it's not a million years off. If we put our heads to it, it's three to five years off. And a sewer packing plant costs over a million dollars from anyone that I've heard from. I don't know anyone, any developer is going to spend a million dollars on a sewer packing plant when they know there's at least the, the thought of sewage coming down the street. And I keep hearing if we don't do something now, we're going to miss an opportunity. I would submit we missed an opportunity 20 years ago we didn't put sewer in it what would be one-tenth of the cost it costs now that's the missed opportunity buying a property and putting a sewer packing plant in so somebody doesn't use it as a trunk company to me is the absolute wrong approach the approach should be let's get a sewer in so now we don't have these issues we're just putting a band-aid on the problem we're not fixing the underlying problem again every one of these studies has said the major impact hampering commercial growth is a lack of a wastewater solution well let's concentrate on that and then the other problems will resolve themselves. Mr. O'Leary. 
Where did we get here? I'm sorry. That's, you, that's did, okay. you did have your hand I up. I did have my hand up, but you know, now I'm, <laughs> my mind is... There's is, other is, is, people is, that want no, to speak. No, no but yeah. the, uh, first of all, I, I think our focus tonight should be on, um, for this board and for the people, for the, for the boards here, but in particular, the... Uh, the facilities master plan committee. I mean, we're talking. We've, we've appropriated two hundred thousand dollars for a facilities master plan committee. You know, fifty thousand dollars for the study's already been appropriated. To not dovetail the the two studies is a waste of money. It's a waste of money. You know, why would we not? You know, conceptually, town meeting has already bought into taking a look at you know. Uh, a master plan which would include, you know, some sort of a town center, some sort of a mixed, you know, municipal use, um, residential mixed and, and, and retail use. We've already bought into it. There's $50,000 here to prove it. All right, so town meeting's already voted on that. We have a master plan uh, that's it's in, about to be released here that we've been talking about for a number of years. The MAPC study, okay, again, to Warren's point, has all pointed to, you know, a municipal investment in order to jumpstart economic development. But what's needed, again, is, is sewerage. Uh, so I think what we need to do tonight is talk about what charge are we going to, so we say, uh, mission? our mission uh, for, for the master plan, uh, for the facilities master plan here, that we're going to the RFP. What should the RFP <coughs> include and what should it not include? So my, my question is, and my point is, why should it not? include taking a look at this area with a potential for municipal use included in it. The studies will tell us what it's going to, what the investments are going to be. I mean, we can all guess, you know, what is it going to be? You know, it's going to be 50 million, it's going to be 60 million, it's going to be, who knows? You know, what kind of grant money is out there? We don't know yet. But without a plan and without a vision, we're just spending money, we're wasting it. Particularly if the two studies are not dovetailed. I don't get it. What are we arguing about? We shouldn't be arguing about anything. I think what we should be doing is, is getting together here and saying, okay, we have the MAPC plan. We have our master plan that's about to be published here. Everything points towards some sort of municipal investment in a particular area between Lowell Street and Winter Street or a little bit further beyond. Why not? Why would that not be included? We have aging facilities here that we need to, to address. You know, does it make sense to put $15 million into this building? when you're sitting on nine acres, future developable land. You know, what should we be doing here? It should be included in the facilities master plan, RFP. It should be included in what they're looking to do and dovetail it. And again, I, I, I wasn't here for the very beginning of your presentation, so I didn't have the uh, advantage of hearing it all. But I did not, and again, our, our conversation at the last meeting went on for hours, you know, because we were confused. We had confused ourselves. You know, we were confused as far as, you know, was it just focused on, on Mr. Heffern's property and should it be or not? We're being told that wasn't the intent. We may have been led to believe that. That isn't the intent. That's why they're back here tonight. Along, again, Economic Development Committee should be included in this. But we're about to spend $200,000 on a facilities use committee, a facilities use plan, a youth use plan, and I don't see why we should be excluding opportunities to be looked at. It should be included. Otherwise, we're not doing a comprehensive plan and we're not looking at it, you know, wide-eyed and you know, fully being objective about everything. You know, the, the costs are going to be what they are and the town will ultimately have to decide these things. But tonight, we have to agree that either the facilities um, master plan, RFP, is going to include potential for municipal properties or investment to be other than where we currently have and land that we currently own. Something else. Why not? particularly dovetailing with what they're looking to do right now and what they already have approval to do. Thank you. This is nice. I mean, I, I'm trying to take these in order. I, 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 know. I, I think she wants to speak to this whole Yeah, yeah I'm going to. Yeah. I'll go. Yeah. <laughs> this is for all of That's right. Um, first, I'd like to make a comment that if this meeting is supposed to include talk about the facilities master plan, then I think that with all due respect, the Facilities Master Plan Committee should have been a part of the CPC and the Economic Development Committee. I think that should have been a part of it, and we weren't. 
I am the chairman of the facilities master plan committee. I believe that our RFQ actually does look at a lot of different properties in town, and it also looks at any uh, town-owned land of greater than two acres. The idea behind the facilities um, master plan is not to designate where town hall is going to be or where the uh, intergenerational center might be. The idea is to develop a sense of what the needs of the town are, how you might possibly reuse some of the buildings, how some of the buildings need to be replaced, for example, town hall. And that's really, it's a beginning point. And yes, it should dovetail with the town's master plan, all right? Um, but I think that if you get too sticky wicked into tiny, tiny details with the facilities master plan, um, you may miss the larger picture. And Don, did you want to talk? Just may I? And I'd, I'd just like to say in, in regard to your comment that you, you were here, and when you do provide input, it's memorable. So you had a lengthy discussion with us at the last meeting about your position on this. So. I do appreciate your comment, but you, you know, you did give us that feedback at the last meeting. Well, but I, we I, also need these other boards, the other board here, particularly the EDC, to give its feedback as well. Mr. Keller. I think then just to follow up on that, then invite the facilities master plan committee to be part of these discussions, the same as the other committees are. I think they, we ought to be. The thing that bothers me most about this when I started hearing about what was going on was that we were talking about perhaps siting of buildings before we even had the study done to know what buildings need to be replaced, what can be repaired, what land would be available for sale to finance the purchase of, of, of or construction of new buildings. That's all going to be part of this study. And to be talking about siting a um, a town hall or a uh, the intergenerational center anywhere at this point before the study is done, then if you're going to do that, then don't do the study because you've already made up your mind. And I don't and I don't think that the town has made up its mind. There's been input, but there needs to be more input. We're a hiring a consultant. We're going to spend some serious money on the facility, looking at the facility needs of the town. We got to get that dovetail it in, I think that's what Mr. O'Leary was saying, and, and, and in, in, in collaboration with all of the interested parties, come up with a plan that works for the town. From an EDC perspective, I don't disagree that these plans, so we don't disagree that these plans should all dovetail. Actually, part of our last meeting was discussing that very fact. This, this meeting would be easy tonight if that's why my first, when I first raised my hand, I asked, what is the ask tonight? If this was about spending the $50,000 in the warrant article to do that study on those treatment plants, go for it. Mm -hmm. Let's see what it says. But then I, I was told, no, it's that plus. Does the EDC feel as though, or all communities feel as though, 66 Winter Street should be used for a municipal purpose? So. Again, I go back to now, again, I'm unclear as what is the ask tonight? Everyone has to be clear as to what are we being asked to give our opinion on. If it's on the warring article, spending the $50,000, go for it. If it's about 66 Winter Street and using it for municipal purposes, the EDC says no. So again, if someone wants to clarify as to what the ask is, we can give an opinion. I think just on that question, I think the ask is from CPC, we want to, we have the 50,000, we'd like to spend the 50,000, this is the scope, it's not about 66 winter, it's about 28 and 62, exact language in here, does everybody feel good about but, that? But that's not the answer I got when I posed well, the question this is, about 45 minutes ago. Okay. Y'all saying it, I don't hear, Rich, I, Mr. Walter, I, right? yeah, you saying it, I don't hear anyone else saying that. <clears throat> so, Mrs. Gonzalez. <clears throat> I just want to say with all due respect to everyone, last meeting, I'm pretty clear that you came in 
asking us about 66 winter, talking about a legacy, talking about Mr. Heffron, talking about wanting to put things on that property, that was the focus. That is how I perceived it, it's how I heard it, um, and I feel like tonight there's all this backtracking and, and changing and saying we were confused and that it wasn't said, and um, I, just, I just feel that that misconstrued. I, I'm not comfortable with it. Um, I don't feel I agree. I don't feel that tax roll property should come off from municipal. Um, this, they absolutely should be here. It's the reason that we're all here because that conversation was going on and we felt they needed to be a part of it. So, I mean, was I alone in that? I mean, I feel like that's how we heard it. That was my interpretation. Uh, it, 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 it was quite clear that was what the presentation was about. So, and again, that I'm glad that we're here to mm -hmm. hear that there's, that it's not just going to be zoned in on that parcel. It will be part of that larger study and will be taken into consideration. And, and I do think it's good that Ms. Mr. Heffron has come forward and stood forward. However, the, the focus would be moving forward on the purpose and intent of that and not just sort of utilizing the funds to that. It's, from what we can hear now, it's not just going to be utilizing the funds to consider that one parcel, but it's going to be focused in on that entire, entire area. Mr. Delaney. One other piece that I'm confused about, and maybe CPC can clear it up. The rezoning did not include the stop and shop property. Am I correct? Yes. But tonight, did I not hear that these funds would be used to include Ocean State job lot property, which is the stop and shop property? Yes. Okay. Yep. So. The zoning changes did not apply to stop and shop. The study, that's part of the parcels under consideration for the study. Okay. For the $50,000 study, wastewater study. This. Yeah, there are a number of other parcels that are going to be included in the study that were not included in the zoning change that was made a year or so ago. Right, the, zo oh, the zoning. All the, all the properties that were highlighted were properties that were rezoned. <laughs> no, it was only on one side of the street. It was only on one yeah. side of the street yeah. that was rezoned. One smaller. It was one side of the street, not the, not the easterly side, just the westerly side, and stop and shop was excluded. And the side going north on Main Street. And, and that, for that, that purpose was to expand potential development, different uses that didn't currently exist, was to expand it for those parcels. Um, Ma'am, can you, do you want to just come forward and state your name and provide your input? Hi, my name is Elizabeth Coolidge Stoltz. I'm a resident. I was the civilian who was at the last select Thank board you. hearing and <laughs> this select board back. hearing. Um, so I heard all of the previous discussions and tonight's. And having had to be an obligate listener both nights, um, they did say, uh, they being the CPC, when they came the last time, that they were here because the area around 62 and 28 was the area of focus historically about whether or not there was going to be redevelopment for a main street. And they did say that one of the reasons they were here or there, if we're talking in the past tense, at the last meeting was because of the Heffron property. But they were as clear as anyone could be with no tech when they were talking with their hands, that they really were talking about using the 50,000 to talk about a conceptual phased redevelopment plan for the broader area. And that although the linchpin was going to be that broader parcel area that included the Heffron parcel, they were not here specifically to talk about it. 
Um, and I have no skin in this game one way or the other, and I actually even live on the other side of town. But I mean, that was as clear as anything was that very long night. <laughs> um, and the purpose, I thought, in terms of the discussions of trying to get inputs from the different boards, um, trying to think of it in terms of a synthesis, is what Mr. O'Leary said, if I can put it into other words. And that is that, in a way, what you're trying to do as the town is to see how many cards are in your deck in terms of options. And then you can decide which, town, which cards you want to exclude, and then it, perhaps it comes to a town meeting vote. But you're trying to figure out how many cards you may have to play, and they might include commercial, private, municipal, whatever but you're trying to figure out the maximum number of options that you have, whether or not you have sewerage now, tomorrow, or the indefinite future. And that's what they were trying to lay out they wanted to do with the $50,000, was figure out the maximum number of cards that you people could figure out whether or not you wanted to play in terms of redevelopment. Thank you. And I do agree that those, those terms were used I actually took a specific note, conceptual redevelopment of this property. So here tonight, it's expanded back to where we thought it would be and where the warrant article and was. the implementation of Ab Absolutely, to right. We even ended that meeting with a discussion where I said, well, acquisition of the parcel would be up to us anyway. So it really zoned in on that and this partnership with Mr. Heffron and focusing on redevelopment of that, redesign of that parcel. We don't need to, I don't think we need to belabor the point. It's now getting late again in the <coughs> evening and we have a Quick. couple of, couple? Uh, Quick, couple I'll be so brief. <laughs> so I need to remind everyone because yes. I think we're losing focus. Yep. In, in October, I believe it was October 2016, we approved that $50,000 warrant article. That's right. At the time, we were still do going down the path with MWRA. And at that time, it was pretty clear to us we were never going to get wastewater down Route 28 and Concord Street, going with the MWRA route. Am I correct? That's correct. Yeah. And then we went to town meeting in October 2017. We got approval. We talked about the benefits of working with Andover to get that connection. And then the board collectively, unanimously agreed that we should put that warrant article on hold because we had a path, a clear path to get Sorge down Concord Street. It had nothing to do with looking at studying storage package plants for town use, for municipal use, and nothing to do with that. I don't believe it's, it says that anywhere in that warrant article. This was tr purely a $50,000 study to help the town educate itself on how we can help commercial properties go ahead and put these package plants in along route, or Concord Street and um, Route 28. So I don't want this to get misconstrued what the $50,000 is and we, how we ended up where we ended up. That's it. The article is actually entitled, I'm looking at it, it was Article 10 back then in October, you're correct, October 16, Fund Redevelopment Slash Wastewater Plan for Section of Route 28 at Route 62. That's the title of the article. For commercial property. For us to educate ourselves on how we work with these commercial property owners to develop their property in lieu of not having a permanent storage solution. The title of the article was a wastewater plan. Not in the doing town. That's not what it says. It doesn't limit it. Doesn't say just commercial. Okay. Okay. So, so now to sort of wrap this up, if there's no further comment. I think I think I think we we are on the same page, right? I, In terms of. Can, can I just ask? This, can you say it? you're on the same page? I just want to hear somebody say that's the way we've just. She said that, that was their presentation, Mr. Walner. Well, so. Mr. Bellavance. I don't. Think I haven't heard yet. <laughs> no. Let's hear from Mr. Bellavance, please. All right. I'm in agreement with uh, Mr. Walner and Mr. O'Leary. I think it's something that we should definitely look at. It's wastewater treatment. I, I wasn't at the last meeting, and I, I don't know how it, I've never was focused on 66. I've always been focused on a larger area. So I'm definitely in agreement well, with those two guys right over there. <laughs> Thank you. In, Madam Chair, just in relation to 66 Winter Street, 
whatever happens, happens with that property. You know, it's, a, it's an opportunity that we maybe can take advantage of, maybe not, maybe want to take a look at, but without <coughs> these studies and without taking a look at, you know, a broader picture of this whole thing, we may not be able to satisfy Mr. Heffern's, Heffern's timeline. But in the meantime, it appears as though, based on some conversations, that he's willing to wait a little bit, depending upon maybe what our studies show, what our focus is going to be on. If it's going to be on this, this area, which includes his parcel, maybe he's been willing to be patient. I don't know. And quite honestly, it matters, but it doesn't matter. In other words, the broader picture is more important. And again, this helped you know, stimulate some more discussion on a more timely basis to have a step up the, the pace on things, and I think that's a good thing. But as far as the specific parcel itself, you know, how it fits into a, a plan that we don't have yet, I don't know. Okay, so if I could just wrap this up, because now we, we, do, we did have a show cause hearing about 25 minutes ago, but we obviously need the input of everybody involved. But if, if, if I could just wrap this up to a conclusion where I think we're on the same page, we're all on the same page. Uh, we certainly understand the value of coordinating these studies for their independent yet related purposes and that the $50,000 uh, the $50,000 that was approved at town meeting to study this water sewer it, this water sewer treatment plant and those options it's it's going to move forward it's just not going to all be redirected to one specific parcel it's going to be considering all of the parcels that were originally designated for consideration so although that parcel is in there and it will be considered as part of the study it's not going to be the singular focus of the study so it's it's more in line with what you know everyone was expecting the results of the study okay. to be, to i be think honest. we have an issue though with the way that the the name of the article that was voted on it was fund redevelopment slash wastewater plan for a section of Route 28 at Route 62. It doesn't sound like you guys are doing a wastewater plan. It sounds like you're, you're doing more of a commercial. That, that's not what the voters voted on. No, the, 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 the language was sufficiently broad, and we did discuss this at length at the last meeting. The, the language was sufficiently broad for this, the study to take place as presented in, in terms of the full, as presented this evening in terms of the full area wherein that particular parcel lies. And it was sufficiently broad to allow it to be considered. There's, that was just the title, but there's that's a whole lot more. That's what it was about. I mean, even looking at the comments, that's what it was about. It was about wastewater. I don't know if anyone else recalls that town meeting. I'm just looking at the notes here. I'm just going to read what it says. Yeah. Rede redevelopment concept plan including but not limited to wastewater treatment options for a section of Route 28 in the vicinity of Route 62. Yeah. That's pretty so, broad. So and then every comment's about sewer. Well, it, it, I mean, it is wow. in consideration of, and the whole purpose behind that so long ago was if, if there was the option to put that in as a thinking outside the box option and business owners could, could you know, buy into it and participate in it, that that might generate some economic development for that area, spark some economic growth for that area. That was the whole purpose behind seeking the funding for this study you know, which again, you know, was halted because of all of the MWRA discussion and then because of the Andover. But we're ready to move on with it because the other studies are moving forward as well and these, these, I don't think any of us are in disagreement they shouldn't be coordinated. All of us that are sitting here think that. So there's not, we, we wouldn't be doing them piecemeal. It would be a waste of our, our funding to be able to do it piecemeal and not consider the other studies that have been done. So I, I think just to, to sew it up, I think, I think we should be on the same page with that unless anyone can tell me otherwise at this point that it should move forward, it should move, move forward in connection with the other studies that are being done and you know that it should be the broader, not just focused on one parcel, one redesign or conceptual redesign, but on all of them. And then we'll, it'll be coming back to us to consider anyway, it'll be coming back to all of us to consider. Right? Mm -hmm. yep. Correct me if I'm wrong. Are we ready? Okay. Are we good? Okay, good. thank you good. both, uh, both of you for joining us and for thank you. Mr. Keller and Mrs. Hurlburt for joining us again. We're going to take a two minute recess just to give people an opportunity to. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Oh my word. <laughs> <laughs> oh.
Okay. We have a hearing in between. Yeah. So you have time. Thanks for your time. Exactly what the exactly what the function is. Oh no, you know, that's you're not at all. I'm so glad you're here. That's so boring. No, but I I it's just that you it's it specifically said this is the linchpin. Yes, this is true. This is true. You're right. It was a poor presentation. Sort of derailed and then after the pastor had one left and revisited it was a one second here. Put it up and it was complicated. They didn't present it like this. They, 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 they threw curves. It wasn't. It wasn't done properly. Oh well, and also it wasn't an agenda item. We were going on the agenda until you know it caught on the agenda and got presented that evening. Which is, I need glasses for this. You know, and I'm a very fast reader. I can read this in five minutes, but you know. Yeah. Yeah. We're rubbish at this time. We're rubbish at this time. You're gonna keep us on task now. Come on, anyway, people. Yeah. No, you're not, and neither do I. You're not. I don't take that disrespectfully at all. So. And, and even if you did mean it, I probably wouldn't have noticed it. <laughs> so don't worry about offending me. I'm not going to. No, thank you. And thanks for coming back. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thanks for that. You're our I know. She's our new mom. She's our new rock star. <laughs> Just, just shut up. She came to two meetings. Even we don't want to do that. Here's what's even more impressive. She was listening here. Yeah, but that, that's actually. Sorry, I, you know, I just said my hand and knew what was. I don't remember this at all. I don't know. This is my phone exactly. there. I can give you the phone to the table or I can this here. The table? Number seven. Yes. Well, we got some of the other ones. Progress nonetheless. Oh, now I can see. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> like a minor but it was so trapped. romantic, Mike. All right, we are at, at um, agenda item number seven, which is the show cause yes. hearing for smokes and snacks, incorporated doing business as Route 28. Lucky Mart is there. Rep are there representatives from? Lucky Mart with us here. Yes. And please identify yourselves for the record. Uh, James Cody, attorney for the uh, licensee. Okay, and you have the licensee here? Yes. Please identify yourself for the record. Vimal okay. Patel. Okay. And do you have witnesses here? No. For the purposes of this hearing? Okay. So typically what we'll do is we'll begin with our police chief who's also here uh, present. So Ch Chief Murphy, if you 
want to present the information? Thank you, Madam Chair, Select Board. Um, I'll be summarizing from an official police report uh, written by Officer David Trefrayer of the North Reading Police Department. On Saturday, June 1st, 2019, approximately 6.30, Officer DeFreya was patrolling Main Street in North Reading. Uh, during that time, he conducted a motor vehicle stop for speed and a rejection inspection sticker. The operator of the vehicle was later identified as a 19-year-old male from Reading, was the only occupant in the vehicle. During that stop, Officer DeFreya observed a 12-pack of Bud Light Lime behind the driver's seat. When the operator was questioned, he said he had just purchased the alcohol from Lucky Martin, North Reading. Uh, the officer then questioned the operator as to why he bought the alcohol from Lucky Martin. The operator replied that they do not card. Um, the 19-year-old was also admitted to purchasing alcohol from Lucky Martin in the past. Um, he provided a description of the Lucky Martin clerk who had sold him the alcohol. Um, once Officer DeFray cleared that motor vehicle stop, he responded to Lucky Martin to speak with the clerk. Once he was on scene, he located a male clerk as the only worker present at that location. Uh, the officer questioned the clerk, who was later identified as Marmik Patel. The officer explained that he had just had conversation with a 19-year-old male who told me he just purchased a 12-pack of Bud Light from that location. Um, at that time, Mr. Patel admitted to selling the alcohol. The officer asked um, if the male who had purchased the alcohol provided an ID, uh, to which Mr. Patel said he did not. Mr. Patel said that that same male had purchased alcohol from him three days in a row and that he had recognized him as someone that he could sell to. Um, he indicated that the first time the male came in, he showed him a main state ID. Um, he, uh, he provided a main state ID. Um, Mr. Patel also said that the uh, male had told him that he was visiting family and friends. So at that time, we did not charge Mr. Patel criminally. We thought that this um, administrative hearing would be more appropriate. Um, and I did provide a memo to the town administrator with our findings. Okay. Council, uh, does anyone have any questions? Members have any questions of Chief Murphy? No. Okay. Um, Council or licensee, do you want to make any <coughs> statement or comment with respect yes, to that? Um, the, the, the way this happened was this particular individual had, had uh, frequented the store three or four times prior to this incident, had presented a main ID, the main ID was scanned. Uh, they have a check ID system where they scan the barcode on the back of a driver's license. It passed three or four times in a row. When this particular day happened, they didn't scan it again because they'd already scanned it three or four times and it all passed. I think what's happening, or what happened here is, technology is, the, the fake IDs have caught up with technology. They're taking legitimate licenses and barcodes and attaching them to the back of identification, whether it's a driver's license or a general identification, and they're passing the barcode test. It is the policy of, of my client's store to check everybody who is even remotely close to being, you know, not of age. And they've never had a problem in the past. This is a first time event, and I just hope that the board can find a little leniency because it is the first time offense. The, the clerk at the time did tell the officer that IDs were checked in the past. It just wasn't checked on that particular day. But I, I, I would tell you that even if it had, it would have passed. That's how good the fake IDs are. Um, and with me is Maul, the store manager, and Sonal, who is the manager of the license. Um, the individual who, who was cited came up with a great backstory that he was from Maine, visiting family and friends for a few weeks. Um, so he, he really, really put the ruse on in terms of trying to get them to believe that he was a legitimate Maine resident. <clears throat> um, again, we, nobody asked for any videotape, so we're not sure exactly what happened in terms of the selling of the alcohol. Um, but as a first-time offender, we would ask that the, that the board be 
at least a little bit lenient uh, on the licensee. And given the fact that they did check the license three to four times prior to this particular incident, and it passed each time, <clears throat> we believe that also calls for some leniency. The, both my clients are here to answer any other questions you may have. And we'd be glad to do that. <clears throat> Mr. Schultz. A little bit out of, it's actually more for Chief Murphy. Um, did the North Reading Police Department confiscate the ID that was used? There was no ID used. Okay, so we, it wasn't on their position. Do we know if the ID had this individual's photo on it? Yes. Was it definitely him? Yes. Okay, and what procedure? Like, I'm sorry, go ahead. Like, we we are not sure who they, the cops pulled over. The cops came with the description, as per our employee said, his match of description, but he had a main ID. So nobody knows, like, who was the guy or cars pull over and who's that person. Okay. I know a lot of stores have a separate set of uh, rules for out-of-state IDs. Mm -hmm. Would you consider going to over 30 for out-of-state IDs? Absolutely. Okay. So well, I didn't hear that from your client, though. Sure. We are checking ID for everyone who look like under 35. And we have a system we established since last year without we having any problem in, uh, pr prior from these incidents. And we have like so many time from the county, uh, county people come for the like under verification and we never had issue any kind of this. I don't think he answered, your counsel answered for you. Are you willing to not accept out of state IDs for individuals under 30 years old? But sir, there is a, if we do not accept the ID, our under age 30 IDs, what should we accept for another ID? There should be some option for it too. So you're not willing to do that? But if, we do, if we're willing to do that one, we are going to lose the business as well. Just for out of state. What percentage of your business is for out of state? Sir, so there are New Hampshire people also coming in the town for the golf. For the golf, there are many people coming for the golf on Thursday, Saturday, and Sunday. Okay. So, Mr. Schultz, I, yeah. I thought you meant whether they would just check IDs for anybody yeah. under the age. A lot of stores won't accept an, an out of state ID for individuals under 30. But they still have the scanning system, which would work with any out-of-state identification. Mm -hmm. It's a nationwide system, and it, it, it works 100% of the time, or, or pretty, pretty close to that. So as far as the age demographic that you want to check IDs for, there has to be some reasonableness. You're not going to check the ID of somebody who's you know, 30, 40, 50 years over right. the age limit. That's the Boston Garden does that. Right. Yeah. I, I, don't, I don't want us to get off on a yeah. tangent. We're, we're here because there was no ID and no ID was checked. So Chief, Chief Murphy, let's no, my, I was just going to say the ABCC recommends any out-of-state license that you ask for a second ID Absolutely. identification. Yeah. And, and you should know that. We're and checking. quite frankly, you look too young to drink to me. So that's a subjective thing, anyone that looks older than 35. So yeah. you should already know that and have offered that here. We are but checking the ID with the credit card name on it. We're here because he didn't have an ID, and you didn't check his ID, though. So let's focus in on what we're here on. But so he did, they did check an ID three or four times prior. That means that you sold someone alcohol you shouldn't have sold alcohol to, you just weren't caught doing it. That's what that means to me. That means somebody used a fake ID. That your licensee illegally. needs to know and spot and not sell to. Chief Murphy, did you have anything else? I don't, didn't mean to interrupt you. No, that was all. I just wanted to. Okay, Mr. O'Leary. The, the scanning system that you use, and they said, did you say was utilized two or three times before? Are there any records of, of what's been scanned? I, I, I don't understand how the system works, yeah. first of all. So, I mean, you know, so if you scan someone in and you scan their ID, is there a record of that scanning having take, taken place? Yes, we do have. Oh. The, the barcode on every driver's license okay. only tells you, doesn't tell you the person's name, it just tells you whether they're of legal age or not. So it, 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 it's not like Big Brother looking at you and saying, we, we know who you are and where you live. It just simply says pass or fail, correct? Yes. So they had checked it on three or four different occasions. I'm not surprised that the officer didn't find his fake ID. I'm sure he didn't want to give it up. He's going to continue to use it. Um, but it was checked the three or four times. Now this this clerk that's used to seeing this particular person, it's passed three or four times, 
why would you do it again? That that's kind of the quandary we, we were in, in, in that it had passed on numerous occasions. But it's a pass or fail test. It's and it, but but it is a nationwide system. You can check an ID from any from California if you if, if you needed to, and it will tell you, yes, this person's old enough to drink, or no, they're not old enough. Okay, but it doesn't say Steve O'Leary came in and no, you scan no, Steve's. It just uh, says pass fail. Uh, no, not necessarily me. You know, you right. Know so me. the you only know way me. we could go back in time would be to know exactly when this person purchased the twelve pack, and then go back in the system and try to find a pass or fail. But it's only going to say pass or fail. Yeah. Okay, There's and, no way to link up a name to it. Yeah, okay, and, and Chief, and, and, and he said he bought it without, it, without an ID. The, the officer got an ID from was it? I, I his forget what his it, regular license. Just his regular license. So at the time, he said he did not use an ID, and then they asked the clerk, and he confirmed that he did not. As far as this ID checking system, I'm, I just had a question. Is this tied into the state, state of Massachusetts registry, or I'm not sure what system they're talking about. It's called the Check ID System. Yes. Correct. And I believe it's a nationwide database that will check the license from anywhere in the country just to determine age, not who the person is. So they scan it. Yeah, it's like anything else, though. If you don't see a photograph with whatever you're checking, it's useless. There was a photo. He did present an ID that showed. What I'm saying is, if the system that you're checking does not provide a, a photo identification, he could have had his uncle's ID. It doesn't. There has to be a photo ID in order for it to check positively. It doesn't make sense to me. If that system exists, we would purchase it. I don't know that it exists to identify positively through picture identification of the person whose barcode is. I, I think that's. I just don't know that that system exists. If it does, we would look into it and we would purchase it. I d and I, I just I don't believe it does because th there's a lot of vetting that goes on with giving people's personal information. So that's why I think I'm suspect of the system, but it's not a foolproof system. It's you have to do your own due diligence to make sure that the person in front of you is over 21. Mr. Schultz, um, just a couple things in the police report, and, and I'm not trying to beat you up. We want to work with you here, but you just want you to understand this is a grave issue. We have, underage drinking is something we take, this board takes very seriously. In the police report from Officer DeFreya, the, in the, the individual who bought the beer stated, they asked him why Lucky Martin, he responded, quote, they don't card. Additionally, he claimed an unidentified friend from Reading also bought from Lucky Martin on, on another day. Now again, Mr. Tierno's not here, not here to speak. It is hearsay, but just do you have any comments on that? If if your store has a reputation of not carding, that's disconcerting to me. If that was happened, we would be caught a long time ago. We are doing business since 2016. We never had any kind of issues in the past. Okay. And we, you have a suspect who's 19 years old and gets caught red-handed. What's he going to do? He's probably going to try to try to get out of it by saying, I didn't have a fake ID. They just didn't card me. On that particular occasion, they, they didn't, but because he had used the fake one three or four times. So I think you got to take what he says. Counsel, you're doing a good job, but I respectfully disagree with you on that one. Okay. Right? It doesn't pass a smell test, but I, I hear you. You're doing your job. Yeah. Chief. I was just going to say that the, the person stopped is actually facing criminal charges for the possession of the alcohol. So he didn't talk his way out of anything. <laughs> I never suggested he tried to. I'm saying he, tried, he he didn't want to give up the real reason why he was able to buy it, which was possession of a fake ID. That's all. I have no problem with what the, we have no issue with what the police did. They did their job, and they did it well in this case. Does anyone else have any questions? Um, do you have anything else you'd like to add in terms of information or remedial measures or? Well, remedial measures, I, I, we've, 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 we've talked about, you know, anyone under, who appears to be under the age of 35 is going to get carded every single time and they're going to go through the check ID system. Um, 
short of that, I'm not sure what more you can do, except as, I'm sorry, the, you the chief? What the chief suggested is what the ABC, say, ABC says, which is get a second form of ID if they out of state, if they're out of state, whether that's what, whatever it happens to be, credit card, something that would back up the information. And I think we could we could that would hopefully eliminate the out of state particular issue. But as somebody who who and I'm sure you folks have had teenagers, and, and you know that there's a market out there for fake IDs, and they're getting better and better and better, and I think they're slipping, some of them can slip through the system. I think that's what happened here. And they've been in business for over three years, and as no, they've never had a problem. So I think they're, they're good business people, they've, they've, they've been good citizens, They've helped with fundraising in town, with the food pantry in town, and I just think that they need, or, or they're asking for, you know, a little bit of leniency because it's the first time offense. And they had done the right thing for three or four times. It would have passed again. But we are willing to accept whatever remedial measures you may suggest, but I think you know, taking it to 35 or even 40, and carding everybody under 40, and any foreign uh, out of state license, check a second form of ID. So, Mr. Walmart. I would just say that, you know, from an owner's point of view, I'd be working with the chief to come up with your procedure and how you plan to handle it, and you should be saying, you know, this, this, makes, this makes sense, because everything else is a guess. And you did drop the ball by not checking the ID every time. It just has to be checked every time. So there's no getting, there's just no getting around it. We can talk about it. Well, you know, we knew them. It doesn't matter. What really matters is, are you going to set up a procedure going forward that works with the police department? Because there's best practices here that I'm not aware of. It appears that you are. Um, you should be working very tightly together. That should be your long-term remedy. I don't know what the penalty is, but I know the remedy, if I were you, that's what I'd be doing. As we'll be working with that. him. We will reach out to the police. Should be file. signing out. I mean, that should be an absolute commitment. And I, I'll just add before we do our findings of fact on this, yeah. and then decide what the penalty will be. That I know that we all have teenagers. Um, you know, I'm sure that people are aware of really good fake IDs, but there are also really good technologically advanced checking systems for that. And yours doesn't work. Whatever you're using clearly doesn't work. It's pretty obvious that he's passed the test of your system more than once. So we don't all have a licensed establishment selling alcohol. You do. And you have a heightened duty to the rest of us to prevent that <coughs> as best you can. And that's great that this is a one time, but it's the one time you were caught. That's the problem. And it's pretty clear his passenger in the car, according to the police report, also said, kids know where to go. And those of us that have teenagers or have had teenagers, they know where to go. So we, we know that, but it's incumbent upon you as the business person to prevent that. So if there's nothing more, I'll take some findings of fact. <laughs> Thank you. Can we go hey, now? I'll move along. And I'll, start, I'll, 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 I'll start with the first, the first three findings of fact that essentially the, the licensee has uh, sold to a minor on June 8, 2019. That's number one. Number two, the minor is actually being um, prosecuted um, for possession of alcohol that was sold to him by the licensee. Number three, the, the, um, the licensee has admittedly actually sold alcohol to this minor at least three other times in the past, um, but he was only caught this one time. And I'll take any more findings of fact from the board members, if there are any. Hearing none, um, I think we need to hear first from the TAs. What's the typical penalty that's been ascribed to this in the, in the, for other licensees? Sure. So uh, historically, when the board has faced a, um, a hearing or has held a hearing for sale to 
an underage person, um, it's resulted in a three-day suspension. Um, gen generally, that is tied to a police department uh, sting operation where they've provided notice to the community in the newspaper or otherwise and let folks know that they're going to be out there checking. Um, in, we look back at a template that uh, Karen and Jane created in the office um, a couple of years ago to look at the history. And there are a few instances where the sale to a minor occurred outside of a sting, which is what happened in this case. And it, it, it ranges from between for a three-day suspension, five-day suspension, and seven-day suspension. Um, and our records, I'm, the records I'm looking at go back to July of 1995, um, which was the seven-day. Um, so the, the first uh, in, in the records was actually a seven-day suspension that took place. Is that for a first offense? Or was that uh, it's listed here as a first offense. It is. Was it to uh, more than one it was sale or two? Convenience have any plus, idea? Uh, yeah. it, it, the note here says it was a sale to minor, first offense, uh, and it was not a sting, it was surveillance uh, due to reports of underage sales taking place, and that was con convenience plus under the previous ownership, I believe. And then uh, they had a second offense um, for a sale um, a few months later, which resulted in uh, revocation by the board which was appealed to the ABCC and the license uh, was ultimately reinstated. And if you fast forward a few years to 2002, um, it occurred at Convenience Plus uh, a third and fourth time. These were police observations for um, underage sale, listed not as part of a sting, but as uh, an otherwise observed by the police department. And they were both three-day suspensions in uh, 19, Strike that. 2000 in 2002, they both helped. 2002 and 2005. Excuse me. And then the last one that's on here, uh, Christopher's Market. Uh, it was a second offense. Um, the first offense, presumably having been as part of a sting, um, and that was uh, the first. Again, the second offense, not part of a sting. That was a five-day suspension. So that gives you kind of the range of what the board has historically done. And I will note, and this is more for the, the new members, and it's totally at the, the board's discretion, but I know in the five years that I've been here, the, the board has historically scheduled the, um, the suspensions um, around a holiday time. So uh, whatever the next holiday has been, the board historically has done. Mr. O'Leary. Uh, historically, it, since I've been here, it's been uh, that would be historic. progressive discipline, <laughs> you know? Yeah. 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 Just for a prohibition time. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. but, uh, it's usually 357. Or revocation totally uh, and because we've been extremely consistent the ABCC has almost always upheld uh, any appeal because we have been very consistent as far as how we've uh, dealt with the issues so do I have a motion can we make a motion Mr. Schultz. Yeah, I would suggest a three-day suspension over Labor Day weekend. So I'll, I would move to enact the penalty of the three-day suspension over Labor Day weekend. That would be Saturday, Sunday, and Monday of that weekend. Mr. Gilberto, I have a motion. Just one so, one piece of information for Mr. Gilberto. Sure. So there, there is a motion that's in the packet. I don't know if, the, if we oh, want okay. to populate it with that information. It, it's one. So, no. that. Is that so it would be, you, yeah, it, it, the intention was that it would be filled out once the determination was made by the board, which it sounds like there's a motion to offer that, and the motion would be scheduled. Uh, and I'm just a piece of information for the board. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure whether, and again, I'm looking to the, the veteran board members for some guidance. I'm not sure if the suspensions have been Friday, Saturday, Sunday, or Saturday, Sunday, Monday, or I have in my head Thursday, Friday, Saturday, or Sunday. I don't know why. Um, so, but that's at the board's discretion. I only, I don't, I remember us deliberating this on Christopher's, and I only was here for the second one, and the first one was a previous owner. Mm -hmm. So it was a little bit of a different scenario. Mm -hmm. oh, Eastgate was 4th of July, wasn't it? Or Memorial Day was one of those. It was a holiday. Yeah. Was it the Friday to Sunday? <laughs> Well, that, that that strikes me as what the board, at least historically, has done when it has scheduled. I'll, I'll amend the motion to Friday to Sunday. Friday to Sunday. Mm -hmm. Would the board consider holding it in advance for a six month probationary term? Mm -hmm. 
What's a board's pleasure? I mean, this is a what, first what defense. Otherwise, yeah. I'll hold the, hold the three-day suspension in advance and for a six-month probation. We work with the police. We look for a new system if there is one, and we cooperate. Well, I feel I feel if they follow that, if if you'd be willing to work with Chief, what's your what's your opinion on that, Chief? Um, so we're we're actually just out of program through our drug free co uh, communities coordinator, and we're actually working with all the alcohol establishments and trying to give them best practices. Um, so we're we're going to be doing that anyways. I would just say six months is a very short window. Um, if they, if you're going to hold a suspension in abeyance, I would I would uh, seek a longer period of time with with a stricter penalty if it's broken no. so holding it in abeyance is just for this particular instance right. so obviously if there's a secondary instance that not only gets implemented but they'd be coming back for another show cause for the second offense right which brings it to an even higher suspension next time around and it depends I think on the scenario some 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 fatality results from it, we would be dealing with it di di differently. Luckily, he got right. caught by the police. But Mr. Schultz? I think we have to be, and I I understand what you're asking for counsel, but I think we have to be consistent with the other licensees in our town as well. We, we don't give a f one free pass. I mean, this is a serious problem. This happened four times, and, and the guy said, that's the place doesn't card. Mm -hmm. There's got to be some kind of um, punishment here, and we can't, we can't set a precedent where the first one's free. It's just, that's just my opinion. I'm one of five. But, but it's not free. As uh, Mrs. Mandy Pelly yeah. suggested, not only if they violate it, they, sus they get suspended for whatever period you say today. Yep. Now they face the second one, which could be a revocation. It could be seven days. It could be whatever it is. Right. So it's not, they're not trying to get off, get off from what's happened, they're just trying to, you know, <clears throat> run a business and make a profit. Yep. We were honest, the clerk was honest with the police and told them about the three three or four times prior. He didn't have to come up with that. He could have just said, I, I don't know anything about this. We sincerely are sorry that it happened. But it's a small business, and if you suspend licenses over, you know, holiday periods, it really affects people's bottom line. I mean, that's where you make your money. You don't make it on an average Monday night. Right. <clears throat> I mean, if it was three consecutive Monday nights, I, I'm just trying to be I, consistent with what we've done in the past. No, that's I know, all. I know, yeah. and I know, I know. You you have precedent. You want to follow yeah, it. That's uh, all. I'm, I just threw that out there yeah. as a as a means of saying, look, what happened shouldn't have happened, but it did happen, <clears throat> and a six month, nine month abeyance, I think, still puts the hammer over the head and says, look, you don't do it again, or you're going to be double penalized. It's the same thing as if he serves three days. And it happens again. We're back again. We well, get double penalized double at that penalized. point. It, yeah. At that point, so yeah. it, 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 what it does is it says to him, "Do the right thing, but we're not going to hurt your business in the short term." That's all. I'm just one of five. That's I, I could be outvoted. <clears throat> Anyone else have any further discussion on the motion? On the original motion. Yeah, uh, the motion would be to suspend for three days wine and malt beverage license, um, Labor Day weekend, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Which is, I think, 28th, 29th, 30th, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. No. Uh, no, that's August no. 30th, 31st, and September right. 1st. Yeah. I don't know if we had a second either on that. We haven't yet. So Thursday, Friday, Saturday. I have a motion. Do I have a second? I have 
No second. <laughs> motion fails. I have another motion. Not a motion. Probably. You know, I have been sitting through a lot of these over right. the years. Uh, this is a little bit, again, I, I take them at their word that they checked this youth's uh, license and they were schnookered three or four times before. It doesn't excuse them from not doing it again and checking it again and telling the officer they presented me with a main license today. You know, obviously they, they didn't check it. Um, had they done that, they could have gone back to the, the youth and said, you know, give me the license, you know, let me see it. And then they could see, okay. And then why I asked the other question was, you know, when you do the scanning, can you double check it? You know, can we double check that you actually did scan it three times? Mm -hmm. um, I guess the answer is no, unfortunately, because it would be nice if you could back up what you said you did. Um, but from a public safety standpoint, from um, the board's um, perspective, we have to be consistent. We have to be um, treat everybody the same if we're going to have appeals before the ABCC. And that's one thing we've been very careful about doing in the past. And, and uh, you know, I think we I think we need to do it. Now, I think what we can do is we can work with them as far as you know, if you make it you know Columbus Day as opposed to. Uh, Labor Day that works better for you and allows you to prep for it a little bit better and maybe it rains that weekend as opposed to the other weekend if you're getting a lot of your business from out of state you know from the, from the Hillview um, you know, we can consider something like that whereas we can work with you as far as the dates you know but I think it's important that the board be consistent uh, from a policy standpoint and from a practical standpoint as far as we're gonna have more of these hearings that have more people before us and they do get appealed and one thing the ABCC has said consistently and I've gone to several of the hearings you know um, is that they've been consistent throughout the years treated everybody the same penalty wise and upheld it so I think we need to uh, ensure that we do that as a board not just for the current board but for future boards so I, I can amend my motion too. so, so I, th I think the three, day, the three days has to be no motion you know it has to, it has to stand but I think we have to take into consideration again if it's you know four weeks away. You know, does that work? Does it impact? I mean, I also know that these people have been in town about three years now, but invested a significant amount of money in upgrading the facility. They run a good operation. It's a nice-looking store. It's clean, uh, well-run, and they made a mistake. So, if it works better over Columbus Day, or if you just want to get it over with for Labor Day, you know, let us know. But I think we need to be consistent. And I just, Unfortunately. for me, I just want to, we, it, it, I understand your position of, you know, don't harm the business, but again, it, it's really, we, we have to address it as the enforcing authority. It's really you harming your business and you harming the community by not being careful about it. So let's just, you know, just own it and fix it. And we really need to hear from you what you're going to do to fix it and prevent it. And I, I, I get the whole idea of a kid coming to you and telling you he's out of state visiting his family and things like that. But again, there's more that you need to be responsible for your business because pretty much most of your business is lottery and alcohol. So that's yours to protect too, not just for public safety purposes, but for your own business. So I would agree with my colleague that we have to be consistent with our yeah, policy. Yeah, we, we had, the last one we had in here has probably been a 35-year member of the business community and it was a first offense. Yes, right. You know, so it's, yes, it, it, we treated them yeah, the same. Yeah. You know, and as, as hard as and as difficult it was it to is. vote to do so, yeah. it was important for us to maintain some continuity and some consistency in, in doling out any punishments when it goes. So right. You know, uh, for that other establishment, 35 plus years of business here. Yes. Never done parents. Someone right. we all knew and, yeah. uh, and was a great business owner in the community and did, was, is a great philanthropist for the community. Right. We still implemented the same thing. So. So. Pick your poison. Pick your poison. <laughs> pick, your, pick, your poison pick your date. Uh, I don't know which one. Is Columbus Day better than. Well, again, the, Labor Day is going to be here before you know it. Fourth of July is over. Summer's almost over already. We want to see you succeed. 
Yeah. We don't want to see a business fail. None of us do. Columbus Day? And I'd also like to see follow through with, with we the We are going to speak with the chief. Yeah. Well, the chief says he's got a new program being implemented anyway. That's so good. That's good. good. That. So okay. I, don't, I don't know what the dates are. Uh, and, and again, whether it's the Friday or the Monday. So, so we have a new motion. I'll modify my motion which, 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 to be it's Friday. Me, which the Friday or the Monday? Well, no, I think we'd go Saturday, Sunday, Monday. Monday is um, Columbus Day. I think the town administrator just said we always did Friday, yeah, Saturday, I don't Sunday. Think, I don't think the, the days of the week are that. But the actual rather. holiday, you don't want to. No, I mean, that, that's okay. Would you prefer the Monday to the Friday? That's fine. It's okay. a, it's Sunday, Monday. <coughs> Saturday, Sunday, Monday. Monday works fine. Saturday, Sunday. All right. Well, I'll so send the motion to be 13th and 14th. Saturday, Sunday, Monday of Columbus Day weekend. So that 12, would be 13th the 12, 13, 14. Is there a second? I'll second. Uh, any, any discussion? Uh, I have a point of discussion. <laughs> However, Mr. Waller. No, no, I'm looking at you. Waiting. Because I, uh, you know. You don't get to pick your penalty. No, you don't. You what? We didn't offer that to anyone else, so. Uh, that's it, not it, true. Oh. In the years past, we have worked with, with the other business owners as far as facility it was still over a holiday weekend it's just a question of the timing you know again this is less than six weeks away okay you know so anybody that's else not untrue. We any other discussion no oh boy <coughs> mr gilberto <coughs> has his hand up thank you madam chair the chief just reminds me we, i just want to double check that the alcoholic beverage control commission did not designate columbus day as a uh, as a holiday in which rest uh, establishments are closed and i'm seeing right here that they did not Licensees may sell or deliver alcoholic beverages on Columbus Day, Monday, October 14th. Right, so it's available for nice it right. would be available for their sale. It's Thank for their you sale. For checking. It's available for suspension. Thank <laughs> you. So we have a motion. We have a three day suspension consistent with the policy based on the facts found. Do we have a second? Did we get a I second, second Mr. Walner? Oh, Mrs. No, Gonzalez seconded. Yeah, yeah. And all those in favor? Aye. 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 Unanimous. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Jane, it's a little messy. Okay. Okay, our next next order of business is a, a nine fifteen public hearing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And I'll read the notice. Uh, in accordance with Chapter 138 of the Massachusetts General Laws, a public hearing will be held by the Select Board in Room 14, Town Hall, 235 North Street, on Monday, July 15, 2019, at 9.15, now oh, 9.55, on the application of Wayama Group, LLC, doing business as Mario's Restaurant for the transfer of the wine and malt beverages license. Licensed to be exercised at 20 G Main Street, North Reading, Massachusetts, in a one-story building occupying approximately 1,200 total square feet with kitchen, dining area, and restrooms. Entrance exit doors located in front and rear of building from the select board. Do we have representatives um, from our to please come up and join us and identify yourselves, yourself, yourselves. Come on up for the record. Prospective licensee and counsel. Husband and wife. Okay. Counsel to each other. Yeah, <laughs> you look like counsel. Please identify yourselves for the record. Yes. I'm Khalid Sykes. All right. So the board has the application packet, and why don't you just give us a little, a brief explanation of what you're here for? Sure. The transfer we, of license, obviously. Yeah. But. So we just purchased uh, Mario's Restaurante in North Redden, and um, we would like to transfer the. Um, beer and wine license. Okay. This application packet, I don't know if the board has had the opportunity to review yeah. it. Does anybody have any questions regarding the application? Just prior experience in the restaurant business in handing alcoholic beverages and service? How do you? Yes. I, I have done it for, for uh, I dealt with the Italian food for about seven years and I worked in Boston in a club business for 10 years, on, uh, right on Tremont Street. So I did handle, you know, alcohol and IDs and things like that. Tips trained? Yes. yes. Yeah. We did the, all the certifications necessary. Was it your own business? No. I used to work for Global Entertainment, a big company who owned those clubs. And what did you do? 
I was actually a VIP director. So I handled the, the floor and, and sometimes I hopped up at the door with the regular customers and things like that. Any, Mr. Walner. I guess I'll just ask the obvious question. How do you plan to handle the IDs? <laughs> <laughs> What's your policy? What's your procedure? Good question. Everybody Good question. gets carded. Everybody. Hey, everybody. everybody. Yes. 15 and <laughs> No, but you know, the, the, the business doesn't do a lot of alcohol, mm -hmm. it's about less than 5%. And that doesn't mean that we're not gonna do what we need to do and check IDs, make sure that uh, the people who are asking for alcohol. Uh, that they also, you, you don't get the alcohol, it's not a takeout business. Yeah. Yeah. Right. You, you, you gotta consider right. it on the premises. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone else? And are you still gonna do, keep the same kind of setup at home delivery and everything? Same exact same thing. thing. Okay. You're not gonna turn it into a nightclub? Uh, <laughs> and you have a new storefront, I see. No, it's really needs yeah. one. <laughs> no, we don't. That's another conversation. Yeah, that's for the master plan. That's the master plan. Oh, once yeah. a month. Don't make us bring in the. Hmm? So, are you already there? And what's the transition plan? We are not. The plan is to sign next Monday, the twenty second, and to go in the, the following day, Tuesday because they are closed on Sundays and Mondays for now. Will there be someone there from Mario's assisting you during the transition? Yes, the manager that they have now is gonna stay with us for uh, two or three weeks, he said, as needed. Okay. And who of the two of you is going to be the manager of the premises? Most times it would be me for now. Okay, and you are listed as a manager of record? Yes. On the application? Because one thing, if this gets approved, you still have to wait. It goes to ABCC for further approval. It's not official until they say yes and vet the, ap the application after we do. Yep. Okay. Uh, Any other? Yes, you you are on. That's not actually. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. We're not also on. be there at all times. You are the named manager of record. Yes. So. You're not on there. I am. Just you yet. are. Yes. yes. Okay. Any other questions? Do I have a motion? Madam Chair. Motion. Yep. Move to transfer the common pictiller wine and malt beverage license held by MR Reading Incorporated, Mario's Restaurant, to Wyama Group. Uh, Mario Restaurant, 20G Main Street, subject to all regulatory department requirements. Second. I okay, have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Mr. Gilberto. <laughs> sorry, Madam Chair, just a I'm note. I'm sorry I don't recognize you before we vote. It's I okay. should do that. It's okay. <laughs> I just would note that there were departmental comments provided to the board with the license application, with the exception of the health department. Uh, the, uh, the health department uh, was uh, addressing an issue uh, which has been resolved to their satisfaction at this point in time. Um, so um, there isn't anything further coming from them. I believe that you need to apply for uh, the formal permitting for the uh, kitchen operation. We uh, have yes. Step. Great. Have it, yes. Excellent. Thank you. Is there any renovation associated with that that needs no. to no. come I don't believe so. And okay. if it is, I believe it's minor. It's a turnkey, okay. it's a turnkey operation. Okay. All right. So. That's been applied for. There's no contingency we need to put on the approval. It, the license is always subject to all regulatory approvals, mm -hmm. but in this case, um, they, they are compliant to this stage of the, of the process, which is where they need to be. Okay. All right. So I have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Unanimous. Good, Good luck. Welcome to town. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. And I'm in walking distance from my office. I will see you at lunch. Absolutely. <laughs> he has to pay for lunch. Yes. <laughs> Charge we'll me double. <laughs> <laughs> Just he Thank won't you. be walking Thank in the so snow. Good luck, guys. Thank you. No walking in the snow. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, thank you all for sticking with us and joining us. Next order of business is tw thank you. 20 Elm Street discussion on development, development alternative, update on where we're at with the 40B. Yes, of course. And I'll recognize Mr. Gilberto.
Do you think uh, we want to do the, just the water restrictions quickly instead of keeping our health agent? I mean, our uh, water, it just it take us two minutes, right? Are we having technical difficulties again? Guys, just a couple seats in front there if you want. Yeah. Uh, Come on down. It looks like we may be. So we I would be. encourage so you to go to that next item while I try to resolve them again. Okay. <laughs> you know, honestly, we have so many people here for public comment that. <coughs> I mean, while we're waiting for the update. Okay. Let's do it. Okay. All right. Madam Chair, through you, the town planner tells me that uh, the presentation only had one visual, which was uh, the subdivision plan if uh, done under current zoning. So I think we can start without, Please proceed. without the technology, which has failed us. Please. Okay, um, so just as an update, um, the 40B plan for 20 Elm Street has been filed with the Zoning Board of Appeals. In the meantime, um, the town had um, requested and uh, the uh, developer had agreed to um, look at some alternatives and uh, Mr. Yaba came to the town with an alternative um, concept, um, which I, I don't know if there's any, has there been um, any, information this is the first discussion of that it's the first public right? discussion okay. other okay. than what's been posted on the town website which i think most most folks okay. here have probably seen um so just as a background um and uh in response to some of the questions that we received um from uh, mrs manupelli just uh, re with regard to the current zoning on this property what would be allowed now what's been proposed with the 40b and then what is being proposed in this alternative uh, alternate scenario um the current zoning, um, residence A, uh, uses allowed by right. Um, this is primarily single family homes, but you can also have uh, you know, places of divine worship, um, essential services, which is mostly utilities, um, uh, wires, gas, electric, steam, water transmission, things like that, um, woodland, grassland, wetland uses, um, and farms. Um, there are some other special permit uses, but they're, they're, um, they're pretty limited. Um, in terms of what could be allowed by right on this property, there was a conventional subdivision plan that was submitted as part of the 40B plan um, showing 10 single family house lots. Um, that's assumed to be what the yield would be if this were under conventional zoning. Um, an open space residential development plan by special permit, if it could be done and if there was an open space set aside that was uh, done in a, such a way as met the town's regulations, potentially could get to 12 units, but that really would be uh, the extent of the density on this property. The current 40B proposal, um, as you know, has uh, five residential buildings with four residential stories above a podium parking level, each building with 40 residential apartments, uh, 200 units total, 25% of the units would be affordable um, or 50 units with all 200 counting on the town's um, subsidized housing inventory. The alternate proposal um, in comparison to the uh, to the 40B that's been proposed, zoning changes would be requested at town meeting rather than uh, at the Zoning Board of Appeals through the 40B process. Um, 160 units have been proposed under this scenario. The height would change um, from currently proposed at 57 feet down to 45 feet. There would be three-story buildings um, versus five-story buildings. The setbacks um, would be uh, 50 in the front versus the, the much larger front setback being proposed currently, which is 450. The rear setback would be proposed uh, to be 129 feet versus the 76 and a half feet currently proposed. And the side setback uh, would be 52, um, which is, I think, the same as what's being proposed now. Um, there would be 16 affordable units uh, versus the 50 that are proposed as part of the uh, 40B plan. 16 of those units would be counted on the North Reading subsidized housing inventory, um, bringing the town from 9.65% affordable housing to 9.93 versus the 40B plan, which um, would be 200 units all counted, even though only 50 of them would be affordable because it's a rental project, 
bringing the town to 10.54%, um, which is above the 10% threshold. Um, this alternate proposal would also um, rezone the current restaurant property and would allow for um, a future phase of additional housing to be put on that property as well. Um, number of units uh, currently we have we have not been told what would be associated with that. Um, I have a marker here uh, from uh, for feedback and discussion is that did mm -hmm. you did, did we want to yeah, I think the thinking was that we would offer just a, a summary of what's being proposed again much of this information has been placed on the town website um, shortly after it was proposed to us and I don't want to speak for select board members Schultz and O'Leary yeah. but I think the thinking was try to get some feedback from the, the board or beyond uh, uh, regarding this alternative so just just for informational clarification purposes I'm looking at what what was in our presentation which I am assuming is the graph that you wanted to it's on page 85 of our presentation so okay. so you have original PEL 40 BZBA and then zone change so uh, um, original being what what he originally came to the town with way correct. back when in May of 2018 and was a PEL being what um, when uh, the developer submitted to Mass Housing for his project eligibility letter. At that time, um, that's what they were proposing, and there have been some slight changes in the project since that time. So what we're concerned with this evening really is the two columns, the 40B that's already been filed now and is in active permitting process now, mm -hmm. and the zone change that is being informally discussed. So just for members of the public, when this, this informal discussions occurred, we have a liaison to our zoning board, which is Mr. Schultz, so he attends and uh, participates as a, the liaison from the board. And then for purposes of this informal zoning matter, so separate and apart <coughs> from the 40B with this particular developer, informal zoning discussions have occurred with two of our members, which are Mr. O'Leary and Mr. Schultz as well, since he's our liaison to the board. So the purpose of this evening's discussion is to, to <coughs> kind of talk about present and perhaps take votes on or what our intent is with respect to this alternative informal discussion that's back and forth um, but however in the in the meantime he's actually filed the application now so now it's in in process so so just to quickly go over those two columns is really all we we really want to talk about so 200 units a zone change 162. I know I'm reiterating what you said, but I just want everyone to be clear because you went through that fast and I have the benefit of looking at something right. that they don't. Right. So the number of units 200, zone change 162. In the application, the number of buildings is five. With the zone change, it's supposedly three. The, num the, the height of the building in the application that's been filed, 55 feet as opposed to for a proposed zoning change, 45 feet. The garage story, one and one for both. Residential stories, in the application, it's four residential stories. And in the informal discussion of potential zoning change, it's three. Um, for the affordability units, it's 25% of <coughs> in the application would be proposed as affordable units. And the full 200 would count towards our requirement um, because they're within that development. In the proposed zoning change, 10% or 16, and only 16 would be counted in, in terms of our obligation, meeting our obligation. 50 versus 16. Um, you have SHI el eligible units, which again, we just said 200 versus 16. You have market one, market two, market three identified here. So. If you don't mind explaining, the bedrooms. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm sorry. Explaining that that part of the grid, the market mm -hmm. one, two, yeah. and three. Um, that how many was one bedroom? How many two bedroom? How many three bedroom? Is that what? Oh, that the market is? rate units versus yeah. the affordable. So one bedroom, units. two bedroom, three three bedroom. So right. In the application, it's proposed as 75 one bedroom in the zoning change, 73 one bedroom. In the application, 62 bedroom and in the zoning change 73 two bedroom in the apple in the application it is affordable no excuse me three bedroom 15 in the application zero in the zoning change and again it's saying 
25 <coughs> affordable one bedroom units in the application, 20 affordable two bedroom units, five affordable three bedroom units versus in the zoning change, um, eight affordable one bedroom, eight affordable two bedroom, zero affordable three bedroom. 311 parking spaces in the application and 311 in the proposed zoning uh, parking per unit in the application is 1.56 and in the zoning 1.92 and then Danielle went over the setbacks um, north you have it as north south east west setbacks which front rear side no. Those setbacks are actually a little bit different from what's in the ZBA proposal. That graphic was given to us by the uh, developer's consultant, and um, they measured them slightly differently. What we re so I called um, the developer's attorney to just verify what we should be going by, um, and it's the numbers that are actually in the ZBA application, which are the ones that are earlier in, the, in earlier in the presentation. Um, so it's not the north, south, east, west. It's the just. Um, Front setback at um, 450, <coughs> side setback at 52, rear at 77. Um, in the proposed zoning change, he's yeah. proposing to expand those setbacks. Um, the Is setbacks would be, uh, some of the setbacks would be smaller and some of them would be larger. So um, for example, the minimum, so the front setback, um, I'm sorry, that would be, excuse me. Okay, um, front setback would only be 50, so that would be a much shorter setback in the alternate proposal. Um, the 450 would be for the 40B that's been proposed. The rear setback would also be bigger at 129 feet versus the 76.5 feet proposed in the 40B. Um, and I believe in both cases, the side setback would still be 52. Um, it's just a smaller, I mean, it, it is a, the, the project is a smaller footprint overall in the alternate versus the 40 bay. So you do have the footprint of the proposed that's in permit says at 58,670 and the footprint in the zoning according to this graph is 66 in the in the proposed zoning change the footprint at 66,273. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I was thinking of the footprint in terms of space, if you were to draw a, a circle around the whole development versus the actual building coverage on the site. So I'm sorry if that was okay. confusing. So what is that just that I just read describe? Which one does that describe? Um, you're reading from that blue graphic? I do not have the blue graphic. I'm sorry. Do, do I you, think it's the um, building coverage. I'm sorry? That's just the building coverage. Thank you. I have one more question for you, just for the edification of everyone that's here. There's a huge concern with the river and the buffer for the river and all the setback requirements for conservation purposes. And in either one of them, it's my understanding that they have been proposed, the planning for these proposed, either one, zoning change and or this permitting accommodates or, or is adherent to what the requirements are. Is that accurate? I actually don't know. Um, oh. oh, you mean in terms of, of, of setback from the, from the river? Yes, yes. Um, I, well, we haven't seen an actual sketched plan with the alter, alternate proposal. There's no visual graphics, so we can't actually measure, like we can't really see that. Um, so I don't know if we completely know that. And also, if we were to develop the, or if we were to go with the second proposal and they were to rezone and redevelop the other part of the property, I don't know where those setbacks would be because they haven't given us any information about that. Okay, so the bottom line that you have phase two, that only refers to if the zoning change is implemented. Right, okay. there would be a future scenario. Okay. And uh, Mr. Gilberto has his hand up. I just want to clarify something. So the grid that you're referring to, the blue grid, that was prepared by the developer, not by the planning department. They provided it to us. It's the only piece of information, I believe, that we have from um, from the meeting the attorney. to share with you. So if, if it seems that Ms. McKnight can't speak for it because she didn't develop it, it's not her document. It was developed by Well, she did a great job. You did a, you did a great job confirming this, but certainly we, we are going to assume that the attorney's accurate in what and he's presented. Right. Well, I, I think a concern that came up earlier today was we had this, you know, this chart, which we then 
convert it into information that we put on the town website at the end of June, which I'm sure, again, many of you have probably seen. The application came in Wednesday of last week. Some of these setbacks that were identified for the 40B project didn't match. And she's described that to say that there was a, an initial, this reflected a draft as of sometime in late June when they filed it on uh, July 10th, it, that the numbers were somewhat different. Right, and we've been, sorry. I don't mean to interrupt you. I just have a couple of questions while you are at the podium from some of the members, Mrs. Gonzalez. So I guess what's most concerning to me here is the phase two. Um, without the zoning change, there would be no phase two, correct? That's correct, because the only application that's been made um, for a project eligibility has been for the site that does not include the restaurant. So the developer would then have to ask for a second project eligibility letter for another site, but at that point, sure the units would have already been approved and we would be over our 10% threshold. So we would assume that there would be no development on the other part of the but site. would still have money to be made. Yes. I assume so, but I don't know how I, that would, would think play so. out. <laughs> and he has listed here assisted living, townhouses, and multi-family building, just for the record. Okay. Mr. Schultz. Uh, first of all, folks, thanks for coming out tonight. It's, you guys are very organized, and, and I've tried to stay on top of what I know on social media with you guys, and it's been very upfront with you guys throughout the whole process. Um, just a couple things I wanted to talk about procedurally because I'm not sure everybody fully understands the how this plays out. The application has been filed. The Zoning Board of Appeals is going to hear the hearing on this. Our board does not hear the hearing on whether this 40B would be approved. Where we would come in is if there was a potential zoning change that made sense, we would recommend that at a town meeting. It would require a two-thirds vote at town meeting. We can't just pass a zoning change. It goes to the voters. Regarding the, the 162 unit proposal. Uh, myself, Mr. O'Leary, Mr. Gilberto, Ms. McKnight met with uh, Mr. Yeba and his crew probably three weeks ago now maybe, two, three weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And um, my concern was we're just two of five. We wanted our whole board to have a chance to deliberate this. We can't deliberate these things outside of the open meeting format of the open meeting law. So we can't have like discussions behind the scenes. We're having this discussion before you guys. I'm going to give you my thoughts on the 162. To me, it's a non-starter. Um, that I would entertain a zoning change if that project was drastically reduced in scope because I want everybody to realize something's probably going to go in there at some level. If we could negotiate something that made sense for everybody, I would listen. I'm a business person. I would listen. I'll listen to anybody. 162 to me, you might as well get to 200 where you get credit for the 200 units. On the 162, all he really did was take out the affordable units. If you look at his chart, we would get credit for 16. So. You know, to me, that's a non-starter. That's just my opinion. I'm one of five. The other issue that I have troublesome with the 162-unit proposal is he th kind of threw in there that he would also be able to rezone where the restaurant and the parking lot lies. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's phase two. That would be phase two down the road. And if you do the 162, it th magically puts our number at 9.92, yeah. I believe was the math? Uh, yeah. Which keeps uh, us under 10% yeah. so he could develop the other parcel. So. Yeah. Okay, so I think the 162 is a non-starter. What I would say, though, is that I know a lot of you guys want zero. I don't know if you're going to get zero. Okay, this is a hard fight. I'm sure you guys have discussed it internally. I think we should continue to negotiate with the developer, negotiate in good faith, and if we can get down to a number that makes sense, I would recommend a zoning change. But right now, I am nowhere near 162. That's just my opinion. I just want to let you know what happened with the meeting, and I truly... Get some questions from the field. Do we have any other board members that have any questions of the planner or comments? And then we're going to hear from members of the public just, who just, have been patiently just, waiting here. Mr. 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 Waller. The affordability, did it include the 450 units from Pulte property? Or can you throw those numbers? None of those units are affordable. So. Uh, no, I know um, that. Oh. But I mean, no, if you add in. No, um, so all the calculations that have been done on our on North Reading's threshold for meeting the 10% goal is based on the 2010 census, which is our year-round housing stock. Um, so all of our units minus our seasonal units, um, which is I think 500, 
5,597. Um, so all the numbers are based on that as a denominator. So when the 2020 census numbers are released um, and, you know, Pulte has built many more units and other development has taken place in town over the last 10 years, that denominator will be higher. So the 9.93 and the 9.65 and the 10.54, all of those are, if it were to occur right now today and only until the next census is released and DHCD redoes their numbers. So all of these are moving targets. Mr. O'Leary? A uh, couple of things. First of all, I, I think what, what people have to understand is um, you know, we offered to engage with the developer uh, in conversation uh, prior to the filing of the application and uh, we also agreed to continue discussion I guess after the, the filing he informed us as to when the uh, filing was going to take place. Um, during our initial discussions with uh, the developer and his team I mean we, we talked about all of our concerns we talked about density you know, we talked about setbacks. We talked about environmental concerns. We talked about traffic impact. We talked about the impact on the community as far as, you know, calls from the police and fire department and a potential impact on the school system. So, you know, they were taking copious notes and uh, they offered to come back with an alternative. And, and this is their alternative. And uh, when they get through presenting it, most of us, I think, if not all of us on our side, they were, were a bit of a, of a, at a loss. And uh, I think I asked the question of, you got to help me here. You know, how is this better? And they said, you know, we were listening to you. It, it, to a certain degree, they were listening to us. I mean, the density went from 200 to 162. Um, the big thing, of course, is um, as far as, you know, three bedroom units went from 20 to zero, which again with three bedroom units, the potential for more kids in the school system is greater. Um, for two bedroom units, it went from 80 to 81, one more. Um, we had talked to them about, you know, we still wanted an affordable component because we are committed to affordable housing and meeting the needs of our community and trying to um, get to the 10% threshold. Uh, and they, um, again, offered us, you know, 16 units as opposed to the 200. And they understood that that was an impediment to are getting to where we need to be. But what they did say, and again, this isn't in defense, I just want to let you know, this is how the, the thought process was when we were asking for an explanation as to how is this in the town's best interest. You know, they said the targeted um, market, you know, for their alternative proposal would be, um, with, with the no three bedroom units, you know, would be uh, young professionals and uh, seniors, you know, older um, residents who would move into the uh, community rather than families. Uh, so maybe so with 20 less three bedroom units. Uh, again, all you know, to see how it works out. But then when they threw in the caveat of the other portion of the parcel, you know, for future development, uh, we, they were a little bit vague as to what were you planning on, you know, because if it would be a zoning change, whatever we zone this property for, the remainderment of it would be similar, you know with the setbacks and all the rest of the impediments that go along with the other restrictions that would go on the property. You know, they talked about, you know, an assisted living, you know, or some townhouses or other multifamily <coughs> units, which would all be subject to permitting and special permit at the local level. So I guess I had a better understanding in relation to how do they see this as being better. And, you know, what they said was, quote, unquote, you know, we checked the boxes. In other words, you talked about density, you talked about, you know, schools, you talked about all these other things. So. Here's how we're checking the boxes. So I would just say that I appreciate their effort and we thank them for that. Uh, and we do appreciate their efforts. But again, it just doesn't, doesn't make that much of a significant difference in relation to the impact on the neighborhood yet. You know, they're, they're not quite there. And then adding in the other additional parcel for future development for housing gets you right back to where you started from right. with just less restrictions on it. Now one of the things that they, they put forth was the economics of it all. And again, the economics drives everything here, right? So it's, you know, can they, what's cost effective? Can they, what can they afford to do and what can they afford not to do? And their biggest uh, investment in the property will be the infrastructure for, you know, the, the package treatment plant, the infrastructure in the roads and the, <clears throat> and the treatment plant for the facilities. So one thing we were very clear with them was, you know, 
the economic impact, whether you're going to have 162 or you're going to have 200 units of producing this package treatment plant is going to be the same. So the economics have to work. But we were very clear in pointing out to them that the impediment that they have here as far as the economics is one that's self-imposed in a choice that they made. You know, as developers, they are choosing to go with multifamily development here that's going to require a package treatment plan, and it's contrary to what our zoning offers and all the rest. So that, that's a choice they made, and you know, you're not going to find much sympathy from us. Yeah, I said, so I said, you're not going to find much sympathy from us in relation to what the economic impediment and what the numbers have to be in order to make it work. Well, it only has to work for the plan and the development that they've proposed. You know, if they went with a 10 unit subdivision, it can handle that. You just can't make it as much. So, you know, he's chosen to go the 40B route. He's offered us an alternative to look at it. Um, we want the input from the other members of the board in relation to, you know, do we, what message do we want to go back to these people with? Mm -hmm. you know, is this acceptable? We didn't indicate that it was initially anyway without conferring with everybody. It, you know, didn't see much of a difference here that would help us. It certainly would help us, it hurt us in relation to the affordable units and what counts to us. I mean, significantly hurt. We get full credit for the 200 units as opposed to just 16 units. So we told them that. Now, should we be continuing to discuss alternatives uh, with this developer outside of the 40B process, which is going to be starting, or is already starting, uh, and there'll be a hearing August 8th, uh, mark your calendars, uh, or not? You know, I'm not opposed to continue to discuss, but you know, I don't want to waste our time, you know, or their time. You know, a lot of this is going to be flushed out during the 40B process as to, you know, what are they going to be allowed to do, and can they get to uh, an agreement with the community, with the Zoning Board of Appeals, as to what would be an acceptable development on this particular site? They would have to make a decision as to whether or not economically it's feasible. That's their decision, not, not ours and not the Zoning Board of Appeals. You know, so there's a lot of discussion that's going to take place in that venue. You know, so my question to the, my colleagues here is, do you want us to continue to try and uh, come up with, with some further discussion with the developer? Uh, do you want us to continue to, to ask if there's some other type of development that they would consider other than what they proposed here? You know, or should we just move on, go through the 40B process, and roll the dice? I don't see why we can't walk and chew gum. You know, so it's, uh, you know, so mm -hmm. that's sort of where we're at uh, tonight, and we want to share with the other three colleagues that, that haven't been in on the discussions and looking for some guidance to move forward, and also to inform you as to you know what our reaction has been uh, so far to the initial proposal as well as the alternative at this point. You know, so we haven't, we don't get the warm and fuzzy, we didn't give them the warm embrace, and uh, we're a long way away from it. Uh, but again, I do want to acknowledge and want to give them credit for at least listening to us and trying to present some sort of an alternative that addressed some of the concerns that we had. You know, obviously, you know, the setbacks to some of the neighbors, particularly on Lynn Street, uh, is significant, uh, more significant there than anywhere else. And they're talking about the height of the building, they're going from basically five stories to three. But they're also talking three buildings with 52 units in them. You know, so the building's going to be longer. It'll be shorter, but longer. You know, so all sorts of machinations uh, to consider. But, you know, at this point, you know, I, I don't see the alternative as viable in the town's best interest or uh, something that we should consider a zoning change for. I think we would have difficulty getting it through town meeting with a two-thirds vote. I mean, we've got five people here. If we all were advocating for it, sure, but you know, the general populace out there comes to town meeting. We need two-thirds vote in order to get a zoning change done. You know, is that uh, something that we think is achievable at this particular point in time? And we were honest with him. It would be difficult. His own attorney pointed out, we're offering this up, but we know what the impediments are and, and what the challenges and the hurdles will be. And he wasn't necessarily advising his client to offer alternatives at this point. But Mr. Yeba did say, let's see if we can continue some discussions, to his credit. So I know we have members of the public that want to speak. So I think let's, I, if, if it's all right with the board members, uh, I mean, we all have comment on it. So uh, let's hear from the members of the public. Mm -hmm. Let them have a chance to comment, and then we'll come back to us if that's okay. Mm -hmm. 
Yep. So if you don't mind, there's, you're going to share this mic and just pass it along, but if, yeah. if I know you had your hand up first. Yeah, she was first. If you don't mind stating your name. Madam Chair, we also have the podium for someone who wants to use Oh, yes. Yeah. So oh, yeah. if you want to come to the podium, please. I don't know free. if I'm tall enough. <laughs> it's fine. No, no, you, you can, can stay there. You've got a mic. Okay. Just state your you name and address. Yes. Up. Hi. My name is Kathy Stewart. I live at 13 Riverside Drive. I just want to under make sure that I'm understanding this clearly. So they're going from 200 to 162 units. And it's going to be longer. It's just going to be whatever. Oh, my. If you, no three-bedroom units. No three-bedroom units. Uh, <coughs> one more two-bedroom unit, and all the rest single. But okay. a phase two. Yeah, so much we're less go, affordable. We're but then go, you have phase two over here. Right. Yeah. So we don't but know now, so he's going to attempt to assuage us that he's going down 38 units, yet he is in the offing going to put in something on the other side, which is going to offset the amount of units that he's taking out. The other little point that I would like to think about, I understand business very clearly. This is about greed and avarice. He's taking out the units that are the affordable ones so he can keep the other ones where the people will pay more. Good for him. He's making more of a profit, isn't he? That's just shameful. But. The other concern, my, and my understanding is that we can clearly not beat him on other principles of school, police, that kind. It has to be done through the environment. Now, you said, Mr. O'Leary, that the, the septic system, for lack of a better term, is going to go from the 200 to the 162. So it's going to handle the 162. It'd be the no. same system. It's the same Basically, system. it's the same system, same but size system, and the cost of it is going to be the same. What happens? when he goes to put on the other ones on the other side, do they put in another pumping system or do they go into the existing one? Because if it can handle 200 units, he can put in the 162 here, put in the other there, and still use the same pumping system, which kind of leaves us nowhere. So that's, well, if we can only beat him on the environmental thing, is there a way that we can approach this environmentally to say that, okay, yeah, you went down, but we still have the same concerns, whether it's 162 or 200, about the environment with the river. But now if you tag this into it, how are you going to tie it in, and what is this going to do, and what happens if there's a problem? You know, then what do we do? So that's kind of my concern, but. And, and those are really questions for the ZBA, though. We okay. don't decide that stuff. Right. We just decide That's whether to make a zoning recommendation. Okay. I just, you guys know my thought on it. Yeah, I All know right. your thought on it, and I just appreciate it. And I don't mean to be emotional, but I think this is just greed. I think, oh, I'm so, so sorry. The, the environmental but, concerns are not going to go away. Right. And they're going to be looked at, and the Zoning Board of Appeals are going to have resources at their dispens at dis disposal to hire consultants who are going to look at all those issues. Anyway. Okay. I just don't think going from 200 to 162 is making a real viable difference. That's my particular thing. 162 plus the option to develop the other plus parcels. Plus the option. Yeah, oh, let's dear not Lord, no. <laughs> it's going to be more units. That's exactly what it's going to be. It's going to be more units. Guys, we see so that. I, yeah. I want to just, let's just keep it so we can hear one person at a time. Really, it's really important because we're having it recorded and we want to hear everybody. Please. Tomu 40 Riverside Drive. I think everybody there knows me. I am in a butter, okay? He's within less than 300 feet of my backyard. And I've been there 35 years. So, Mr. O'Leary, I'll address you since you've talked to him. Was this, was he honest and truthful or was this a ruse? Because I think to my colleague here, He's opened up another trap door. But you, I, what I heard from you was his lawyer kind of told him, hey, this, this, you, you're spinning your wheels. Is he, is he spinning our wheels? I think, uh, the, and I, I'll speak for myself, and Mr. Schultz can speak for himself, and the town administrator, and, and Danielle. I think this was an attempt on Mr. Yeba's part to get his development team to offer an alternative which was less intrusive than what was being proposed. I also believe that he was doing it against the advice of his counsel, okay, Mr. Rignanti. Mr. Rignanti said right off the bat, he doesn't think, you know, he understands. The guy, is, he wrote the 40B laws. He's been around a long time and represented a lot of developers. You know, he believed that it was going to be very difficult to get a zoning change 
through town meeting, particularly with the magnitude of what was going to be proposed. You know, I mean, I proposed and the board voted to put an article in the town meeting warrant in June for a potential to open up some discussion with, the, with these people for a potential zoning board change, you know, zoning uh, law change. And, you know, that facilitated the discussion. Uh, so I don't think it was an attempt, again, I, I take it at face value, I, I don't think it was an attempt on his part to, you know, pull the wool over our eyes or anything else. I think he truly told his development team, and he spent the money to do it, you know, to put his, go back to the table, listen to what they had to say, how can we address the concerns, and how can we still make it economically viable for what he believes he wants to do. So I don't think it was a ruse. You know, I think, I, think, I think it was an honest attempt on his part to address it. I think that when they made the presentation, correct me if I'm wrong, I yeah. mean, they were excited about it. It was just going, help, no, help, but help, they, us, help us out. You know? But they didn't address the <laughs> fundamental <laughs> big issues, the density, the environment. Well, the, again, they addressed it, but not to the degree in which we would no, be satisfied. No, in my view, no, they, they did nothing. Mr. Yeah. Wu, I, I was at the meeting, too. I want to give you my thoughts as well. Um, I, I'm, you know, Mr. Yeb is not my biggest fan. As far, I'm sorry, I'm not his big, whatever. He, he doesn't really care for me. Let's, He's let's made that keep clear. this to the dialogue But what I would say is, facts, I want to say, though, well, that is a fact. He's told me that keep, in keep meetings. It, keep <laughs> to the facts of why we're here. But what I would say, though, is despite that, I, you know, I'm going to take somebody on their word what their word is. I don't, I mean, I can just look at the facts and make my own decision. I don't know what his, mo I mean, his motives are to make money. He's a businessman. I get it. That's America, all right? We're also here to protect the town, okay? We're going to do what we feel is, is in, our, in the town's best interest. You know, I agree with Mr. O'Leary, the 162, I would almost rather get stuck with the 200. At least we get credit for the 200 towards our affordable ratios. I, agree. I don't want either, but if I had to pick, I'd pick that. So, you know, I don't know why he came with that, thinking it would be acceptable. I did leave the meeting like, why did they think we would go for this? That was my initial reaction. But I don't, I encourage him to try. I, I would still encourage negotiation. I'll meet with him. I'll sit down and give him my thoughts. If he got down to a number that I thought made sense, we would go to you guys and say, you know, we could get stuck with 200 if this goes forward. Otherwise, we know we can get this. You know, sometimes you got to cut a deal. But we're nowhere near the numbers that I would find acceptable. No, I did just one last thing, and I'll let my other colleagues talk. Did I hear correctly? He's got 19 acres there. All right? I, I walk that area at least once every Monday. The thing hasn't been developed over the last two, three years. Quite frankly, it looks horrible there, all right? And somebody cut a big hole in his fence in there. So is what I'm hearing, what I heard tonight, was it 10 housing units? Is that what typically would be there? Ten. Oh, under the zoning bylaw, yes. 10, potentially 12. Yeah, ten, yeah. ten townhouses, no, maybe. No, 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 not no. townhouses. Ten, 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 ten single family ten, homes. Ten, ten, no. yeah, ownership, not apartments. Single family homes. That's right. Th so that yeah. may be be palatable to us, all right? Uh, now, I'm looking for zero. Maybe I'll, I'll concede 10, but I'm not going to go anywhere near 162 or 200. So I'll let my colleagues talk. Anybody else? Would anyone else like to speak? Please. Jeff Stoltz, 2 Gillis Drive, we met earlier this evening. Um, so while I appreciate that he came forward to have this discussion, I think the one thing that just about everybody in this room has come to the same conclusion that I have is that in the end, the proposal that he put forward actually will yield more money for him in the long run. You know, and that was the greed part. Um, but what my concern is, is why he did that. And I believe that he did it for one of two reasons. One is just because you asked him to, so he did, so he fulfilled whatever obligation he felt. Or is this the first part of his strategic plan? And I'm just going to put forward that a strategic plan that starts off with something that's a non-starter because he's going to make more money by doing it which clearly he's going to when he included the Teresa's area in his development and he's going from low cost housing to full cost housing for the vast majority of the houses, you know, or the apartments, you know, is, is that, that, that's clear. And, and you are business people. 
I'm sure that you could crunch the numbers and come up with the same conclusion that I that that we I think the vast majority of us here are coming to. My concern is when I'm hearing some of the things that you're saying is you know what's his next step? You're absolutely right. You know we should always be open to negotiation. But my concern is that when he comes back and he says, okay, you didn't like 160. What about 120? Or what about 100? You know, and where do we stand on that? And those types of numbers are entirely unacceptable. Um, to the point that Mr. Wu just made, you know, if they came back and they actually used the zoning as it's prescribed, you know, I don't think any of us would, would be against putting 10 houses in there because it's already zoned for that anyway. You know, and I'm seeing you're not, you nodding as well. You know, but I am concerned that this is a part of the strategic plan in the end to get us to agree because we're going to feel good because it's no longer 200, it's no longer 160, but will we suddenly feel really good when it's 120 or 100? I'm going to say, from my seat, if that's where he's negotiating, we should not be negotiating with him. Because good faith to, to him, for, for, for him, is to be thinking about the environment that we're coming into, the community that he's coming into, and the commitments that he made sit to this group seven years ago where he said he would never do anything that would be disruptive to the neighbors of Teresa's. He has obviously forgotten that commitment. And by the way, board members, and, and at least one of those board members is sitting here tonight, you know, made the comment that, you know, we will take Mr. Yeba on his word. Okay, I'm calling out his word right now because he made that commitment. And I'm going to tell you there are a lot of neighbors sitting right out here in the audience who will tell you right now that, that he is disrupting us. It is now 1042 at night. The last place I want to be on a night before I need to, to be presenting all day tomorrow at work is talking to all of you. But I am because this is important. And my life has been disrupted by Mr. Yeba. And... I would, am, am here, along with my colleagues here, to do our best to be sure that you understand the level of commitment we have to protect our community, to protect our environment, to protect the lives that, that we have come to, to enjoy. And the lives, by the way, that Mr. Yeba, seven years ago, sitting with this group, said that he was committed to protecting as well. I thank you very much. Is there anyone else here that would like to make any comment or questions? What's the agenda tonight? I'm Sandy Woodman, I live at 34 Elm Street. I think most of you know me, know me a lifetime. Yeah. Um, there's nobody that's more affected by this project than we are. If you've looked at the maps, um, we're surrounded basically by four sides by the Thompson Country Club. The Haywood Ave extension that's across the street from us is actually not a public way, it's a private way. We own to the middle of the street. Thompson Club, on the other side, owns to the middle of the street. Haywood Ave, which is a proper street, and goes up to Haywood Ave Extension, up where the expensive homes are, and probably my neighbors are here tonight. Um, so this project affects us probably more than anybody. And yet, you know what, nobody, <coughs> I've made, I sent letters to conservation. I forwarded them to the Board of Selectmen. I forwarded them to the town manager here. I forwarded letters to the DEP, State of Massachusetts, the Conservation Commission, State of Massachusetts. And you know who I've heard from? Nobody! You guys stand, sit there and say that you're standing up for the, the neighbors and the residents? You know what? Excuse me, I haven't seen it. We lost water in our well. I'd like to get up and get that board right there right now and show you that the Thompson Country Club dug out the brook out back years ago and the water table has continued to drop um, since they dug that ditch many years ago. So we would be looking at the same condominiums that they have across the street at the Woodlands, and my mother, God bless her soul, English-Irish, boy, you wouldn't want to mess with her, I tell you. Be it as it may, she fought the, the condos across the street, and those of you that have been around long enough, those were, uh, I have some particular colorful adjectives I'd like to use, I'll try to refrain. 
That being said, it was a cluster F when they put those things in. They ended up having to put in all windows, there were leaks, the plumbing, the electricity. It was a nightmare for anybody who bought homes over there when they first went in. You know what? It's a nice community over there today. You know what? We'd be looking at the exact same development behind us if the perk test didn't work out years ago. So I'm probably spinning my wheels right now because I don't know what you guys can do or decide tonight. We still need to deal with environmental and conservation and whatnot. What do you guys get to do tonight? I mean, I, question. I'll what speak to that. Yeah. I, thank you for your comments. And first of all, just to address some of those comments, we did get the letters. We had a team of people looking at this very intensely, incorporating all of the comments. This is not the first time, and this is not the first interaction that we've had with residents not just those that are the most significantly impacted, as you've stated, but residents all over the town who wanted to have input in this initial process. Those were all incorporated in. Not, and we weren't the only ones that had the opportunity to present correspondence to mass housing. There were a lot of residents that provided their own <coughs> commentary directly, just like you did. However, all of those, we have our planner here, our TA here, all of those were considered and incorporated into a fairly lengthy position statement that was presented by the town that con concerned all of those things across the board. And we're not done. That's why we're here tonight. What we're here tonight to do is for us to hear from members of the public on this and also to give our two colleagues on the board some direction as to where we want them to go, if we even want them to consider any further discussions with this particular petitioner. So that's what we're here to do. We don't decide this. It has a vetting process that it is now in permitting with the zoning board. But we can speak on behalf of people that w have contacted us about it and speak on behalf of people that are here. To, and you can too. And you should be going to the, the meeting at which this is <coughs> permitted or, or considered and that's a zoning board. So we do have to take <coughs> that active role in this process, although we don't decide this, and we've been very clear about that. But to our colleagues that are spending their time trying to work something out, because they know people are impacted by it, and they know the whole town is gonna be impacted by this. Those are the colleagues that are spending a tremendous amount of their time trying to work this out. Now they're asking the other members, what do you want us to do here? I know I have an opinion on that, and I, I want to reserve that opinion till the end and give people the opportunity to talk to us about it too. So that's what we're doing. That's our agenda here. And we appreciate that everyone has stayed here this, this late in the evening. And we've heard from people and residents that have stayed at other meetings for us before. We are handling other business, so unfortunately it's late. This is kind of common for us, unfortunately, and we never get an audience this late. However, we are here this late attending to business. So we want to hear from people. We want to know how it affects you. We did get those letters, not just yours, but other people's. We did address it. We had our <coughs> staff intensely focused on this right from the beginning. As an alternative to this, we've had members <coughs> taking time out to intensely focus on, is there another palatable option here? So from my particular perspective, there's an old saying, actions speak louder than words. So we've had people invested in this, working on this, not just on your behalf, but on our behalf, and trying to move forward with something that's palatable. But the actions speak louder than the words. There is no petition for 10 single family residences. There's an alternative proposal that was in these informal discussions, and the application was filed. Actions speak louder than words. We don't need to consider someone's motive, whether it's financial, greed, or otherwise. The actions speak for themselves. So now we're left to address and hear from you with regard to what is now in application and permitting process. And that's really why I think I'm here and why I need to give my two colleagues direction on whether or not they should continue this informal discussion with this person who's already filed the application. So now we're on a time track that's very limited. 
And that's what I'd like to focus in on, in addition to hearing from everybody that's here who wants to speak to us. Okay. Can I just clarify yeah. something quick? I just want to clarify something that um, Andy Schultz said earlier, that I didn't find out until I came onto the select board that I don't think people realize is open meeting law. We can't discuss this with each other outside of here. So this is our first time getting to hear from each other how we feel about it also with you. So um, I don't think a lot of people realize that. I didn't. So just to clarify that. Um, Carol it, Veronica's 30 Hang on just rest. one sec. I just want to oh, speak sorry. to your, your sir, Ms. Wimizzi. You have every right to be angry. I'm not going to tell you not to be angry. You should be angry. I'm not happy with the situation either. He lied. Oh. You know what? Um, well, let me just, let Nick me just and I get along well, and we have got along well. As a matter of fact, I would consider Nick Yaba a friend of the family um, until my mom passed a couple of years ago. Um, and if my mother was here today, she'd be down knocking, knocking on Nick's door, screaming at him. That, I just want to address some of the concerns you made, though, that you didn't think people were working for you. Because I want you to know, you don't know how many hours I spent on this. How many hours I've taken half days out of work to come to town hall for a meeting or this or that. How much time I've spent on social media trying to keep everybody apprised. As soon as I know something, I tell you guys. There's no secrets here. Okay. I've spent hour after hour. Other members of this board has too. I don't want you to think no one's working on this because that's full. You know what our salary is for this job, right? Same as your salary for being here tonight. We get nothing for this. Okay. But, but grief sometimes. We're working hard for the town on this. I don't want you guys, I don't even think for one minute that we're not. I. I haven't kept my time, but I can I, tell you I it's hours after hours. You guys, it, and you look at the plans on this, and you're all residents of the town. And I, and I close my eyes and go, how can anyone that looks at this plan, that lives in this town, how can anyone conceive of such a, of such a project? I don't in, disagree with you. In, in literally yeah. one of the most beautiful residential areas in town. 40B allows for these projects. I don't disagree. I, don't, I agree with you. I, I, I get said. it. Yeah. And I understand the rules. Our hands are tied. But I don't want you to think we're not working for you. That's the main purpose of my okay. comments. Please. Please. You were, you were in the middle of saying something. Yeah. Please. Hey? Yes. Oh, yes. Carol Veronica is 35 Brassy. Could you please explain to the group two things? Um, I think we have a solid core group. Most of the people in this room have been here for every single meeting. So. Maybe you could explain to us, first of all, um, if we don't accept his alternative plan, which I think is going to cause more problems on the property and nature and conservation than his original 40B plan. So if you could advise us if we reject this plan, which I think everybody seems to want to, um, what will happen going forward dealing with the 40B, you know, plan, plan A. And number two, maybe you should ask for a showing of hands here so you can get a pretty good idea of who does or does not want plan B. We, we talked about plan A, we already know what that is. This alternative program, maybe you could ask for a show of hands and I, th I think I know that like, vote. <laughs> no, but I'm saying so then that we yeah. could just take that off the table and know what's going to come next. Let me That's answer all. your question, mm -hmm. though. As far as procedurally, and if I'm mis not answering your question, please interrupt me. If the 40B has been filed, that's just going to go along through the zoning board. At the same time, on a second train track, kind of for lack of a better term, we can still negotiate and meet with the developer and try to come up with something that we think makes sense. Do I think we're going to get there? No, but I don't have a problem with talking to them. It never hurts to talk. If we got down to a number that I think makes sense, I would recommend it. We're nowhere near that right now. Okay? That, and it, that's, and I think that dovetails into your second question is I can't, I, well, I can't speak for all of us, but I don't think there's a huge appetite for the 162 here. So I, don't, I think it's kind of a non starter. That's, that was your second question? Well, yeah, because we're ultimately going to end up with more units on the property and well, stress the river you, and the I know. conservation. We, we, we see that. It's the first thing I remarked yeah. when I saw it. So I mean, yeah. we, we get it. Um, but it doesn't hurt to keep talking and seeing if you can, because if he, don't forget, if the developer can get something through a zoning change, he doesn't have to deal with the 40B process. Yeah, this is a negotiation. Absolutely. That's what this is between the developer, and that's what any kind of 40B application is. It's a negotiation between the ZBA, the town, and just the parties. 
we try to come up with something that makes sense. I'm not against this project. I'm against where this project is. You put this project in the right location, I'd be fine with it. It just doesn't belong in this residential area. So, but 40B doesn't, the law doesn't really give us any relief from where it is. going on and I appreciate all of your efforts um, I'd like to turn the tables just a little bit if we could because I appreciate all the time and all the work that you people are spending doing this and then we you come back and we say no we don't like that and okay. you might not like it either what can we do to help you what else can we do to help you help us I think go to the ZBA meetings Okay. Have your voice heard during the actual <coughs> process. Okay. As far as the negotiation, we're, Steve and I are doing with the builders. We will continue to do that. That's, those aren't public meetings. Okay. But we're going to report to the public whatever comes out of those meetings. You're going to know. I mean, I don't know if you're on Facebook. I put it out there exactly what's going on. You guys know. I will continue to do that. So you have my word. But go ahead. It's very important to know that what we're talking about on a parallel track, if it's the majority of the board considers that's a worthwhile endeavor here and what what and we want them to continue going and we can certainly take a, a show of hands if that's what you want us to do give us a show of hands do you want them to continue on this parallel track of trying to negotiate some informal other zoning change why don't we do that right now yes the only thing that's really decided tonight is whether you guys are going to go forward to yes with that's a right. change to of recommend a change that it's really important to understand change of zoning yes. the process, yes. right? and, yep. it, and that if this. that if that happens we work again with our planner on what does that look like how does that read that goes on it's that goes on the article for town meeting and if that's something that you want to go through and that has your seal of approval, you have to go to the town meeting, which sometimes lasts late like this, too, to get through all the articles, and vote on the article, up or down. So mm -hmm. that's another really key piece. We can't change the zoning. Yeah. We can if only I propose might. a zoning change. The town changes the zoning. Town rules. If I might suggest, Mr. Yava does not want to risk putting a proposal before the majority of the town on a, on a ballot to change the zoning on there so he can put in 162 units and then rezone the existing Teresa's business and parking lot and put another unit in, uh, put another 88 or something units in that I had, had heard proposed. There's no possibility that Mr. Yava is going to spin his wheels on such a possibility. That's... Yeah, I don't disagree. <coughs> yeah, um. Is, is the select board going to take a vote tonight whether you're going to um, vote to recommend that your liaisons continue the conversation or not? Are you going to take, I think that, take would, that as a vote? Yeah. That, the, purpose was to, the purpose was to vote on zoning if we thought this was to vote on, you know, amend, you know, proposing amended zoning. That was why this was listed as a vote. However, where it's at, I don't think and I don't want to speak for the five, but there's not a consensus that where it's at is palatable. So. I think that's what we'd like to see also. What is the consensus of the board? You know, continue with the alternate discussion or just vote upon the group. You know, I mean, and I agree. I think this should be a show of hands. We've been here this, this late. So mm -hmm. you get our support of knowing sure. which way you, where you want to yeah. have your vote. You just remember, talking, continuing talks doesn't mean agreeing. It just right. means continuing talks. Right. There's no harm in talking. Still has to go through approval yeah. process, right. uh, sir. Jack Wyland, uh, Spoonway. Uh, just a comment on the alternative proposal. Uh, been in business for 100 years. I I find his alternative proposal incredibly disingenuous. I don't see that as a good faith first time effort in the least. Um, if the discussions continue down that path, I'd recommend stopping them. Just, just to uh, add to Jack, that's why I asked the question, Steve. Is this a ruse on his? I know, I'm, I've been in business as well. So what's the underlying, what is his MO? He knows he's going to get a difficult time on 200 units. So he's scaling it back down. But you've got to be genuine. You've got to be honest. That's when, when I came here in January and I asked, 
why I wasn't notified during the walkthrough, because I came back from Florida. I should have been notified. And then Mr. Prisco said he can do that. And I come back, I said, that ain't right. Does everybody agree with me on that? It's not right, but it's the law. He doesn't have to notify you. But as, as a developer, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a neighbor. I would, if I was a developer, yeah, he didn't have to by law. But here's my, here's my neighbor. Hmm? Uh, uh, she had to make an adjustment. She had to notify everybody. The rules aren't right. That's the bottom line. We don't write the rules. No, I know yeah. that. <laughs> but okay. what, what's right? I think, I think, I think we have Mr. Mr. O'Leary wants to make a few comments. And I think, I think really what was on was consideration of a potential, are we going to support a zoning change based on what their informal discussion? I, I don't think we're at that point right now. But I also do think that we have to determine, is it, is it a worthwhile endeavor? Right. We, we can't really question motive. It is what it is. It's going to be developed. So is it a worthwhile endeavor to continue to have our two board members, our liaison to the zoning board and our other board member, be talking this through with him to see if there's any potential for movement on his part? And that's really what we're here yeah, but, on. But to, to Jack's point, you got to come as a businessman, you, you got to come with some heart and some honesty. Tom, this is round one of a 15 round fight. Yes. No, be patient. It's no, and I've been there 35 years. Yeah. All right? He came <coughs> after me. Yeah. Okay. okay. So I, I, we do, it's getting very, very late, and we really do want to wrap this up because we actually have more business for our, to, to take care of. So, Mr. O'Leary. Can I just okay. quickly? Don't be sorry. It's okay. Um, well, I, I, do, I wanted everyone to have the opportunity no, to, to be able to speak, but. Sandy Valenti, 6 Hayward Farms Lane. I just, you've seen around town, um, many of us have formed uh, a corporation, Defend Ipswich River Communities. Hopefully you've seen the signs going up all around town. We had an initial 100. We're now up to 200. It just shows you the amount of energy, passion, um, I think and fight are in people around this issue. So Steve ran into me when I was sweating, putting him up over weekend. the uh, July 4th weekend, which was sort of apropos. But I just wanted to officially say for the record that Defend Ipswich River Communities is against the alternative proposal for 162 units. Thanks. Mr. O'Leary? Uh, first of all, I just want people to understand this is a, an aside, as, as Andy pointed out, you know, a separate track, you know, and, and does the board want, want us to continue, you know, want us to continue on this track and continue discussion? It doesn't have to be necessary specifically. Right now we're talking about a zoning change, maybe something else, and another alternative will come out of the discussions. Uh, you know, do they want us to continue uh, to put some effort in here to, in the hopes of coming to some, some other compromise? Now, one of the things that, that people have to understand, and, and I understand your frustration and, and consternation and maybe some anger here. Um, the idea is not necessarily get to yes, you know, and yes on any proposal here. The idea is, you know, the state has already determined that this is a suitable site for housing, you know. So suitable to what extent is to be determined here at the local level by the Zoning Board of Appeals based on facts. And again, we're going to have the resources available for the ZBA to get the facts. You know, so people are not going to be necessarily happy. It's already been determined it's a suitable site for housing. Now, it comes down to economics. Can he put 200 units in? We're saying, no, too dense, not right. He's saying the numbers have to work. Well, we don't care about his numbers and how he has to justify and whether he makes money or doesn't. That's not our concern. It's, you know, what can be done on this particular parcel under the laws of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, not our zoning bylaws, because this totally bypasses our zoning bylaws. Nobody sitting here is in favor of what's being proposed. Nobody. Because it's too dense, it doesn't fit in the neighborhood or the character. But we've had other type developments proposed and built in the, in the town over the years against our wishes. What we did, we mitigate the impact. You know, so everybody up here is on your side and has the same concerns. I've lived here my whole life, you know? So it's, you know, it's not directly imp impacting my neighborhood where I live, but it impacts my community. You know, we're, we're here as volunteers, volunteering hundreds and hundreds of hours a year, 
you know, on your behalf that you don't even see or hear necessarily, but when something like this comes up, it engenders an awful lot of uh, excitement and, uh, uh, and interest. So we see it. You know, to your point, you know, what more can you do? Continue to do what you're doing. You know, continue to, to be heard. Continue to voice your opposition. Do it based on fact, not, not emotion necessarily, but do it based on facts. Because the ZBA can only consider the facts. They can't consider the emotion. It's happening in my neighborhood. It's, you know, the, the environmental stuff will be addressed, and they're going to have to comply. You know, the density and the types of uh, you know, waste disposal is going to be dictated by the facts. You know, so all of that's going to be considered. Everybody's going to be, the resources are going to be made available to evaluate those facts. And we're going to sit here. I don't want to necessarily say to Mr. Yeb, you know, go to hell. You know, he has every right to do what he's doing under the law. He didn't write the law. You got a problem with the law? Call Bruce and, uh, and Brad. You know, have the laws changed. You know, we're dealing with what, with what we have handed to us here. You know, 10%'s the magic number, we're not there. So we have to deal with this. If we had 10%, we wouldn't even be talking about it. If this board, previously, not too long ago, we had an opportunity to take care of this situation with the Pulte property, and we opted not to. This board made a conscious decision not to have affordable units over there. We went for the money. You know, is that a mistake? I thought so, but that's okay. But part of the thought process was, and Rich, you were the Economic Development Committee, was, you know, go for the 30 million bucks, take some of this money that we're going to realize from it, and start building some affordable housing. We have an affordable housing plan that we submitted to the state last August. The ink isn't even dry yet, and they still give this, this applicant an approval. You know, but this board made a conscious decision not to take care of it. If we had done the Pulte and taken the 18 and a half million instead of 30 million dollars, we wouldn't even be sitting here. You know, so there's culpability. But I'll give the other two members a buy here because they weren't here. You know, the board made a conscious decision, and this is part of what we have to deal with. So now, what do we do about it? You know, how can we handle it? The facts are going to play out. The resources that we need to put forth to defend our position will be available, and, and we'll, we'll see what the consequences are, see what we come up with. The gentleman has a right to build on there, and he has to do it, and he has a right to do it under 40B. It's contrary to all our zoning laws here. So are we going to get stuck with something here? Probably. You know, is it going to get to a point where if the Zoning Board of Appeals says, you know, 42 units, you know, he gets to appeal that because economically it doesn't make any sense. Well, his economics at that point doesn't play into the equation. You know, it's the facts show that it can only support 42 units. You know, and he's saying, but if I have to spend X number of dollars on the package treatment plant, well, that's his problem. Then he has another decision to make. So there's going to be an awful lot of discussion taking place, an awful lot of fact finding, and uh, his consultants are going to be fighting with our consultants and our attorneys, and, you know, you can be assured that everybody the Zoning Board of Appeals, the members of this board, are going to be looking out for the town's best interest, which is your best interest. And chances are we're not going to satisfy everybody. You know, like I tell people who first get elected to the board, you know, you're at the height of your popularity the first year you get elected. From there, it's all downhill. You're just going to piss people off. And that, it's happened, you know. I've been able to survive for a while, but uh, truly, it, it's, it's a very difficult situation for us. A lot of time and effort and energy, a lot of your resources, your tax dollars are going to be put forth to defend our position. So whatever the outcome is, be assured we're doing the best we can with the cards that we've been dealt and with the resources, and again, we're not going to spare the resources in order to make sure that if something is built there, it's going to be the best thing that can be done as far as the impact of that community, your community, your neighborhood, and what the land and the environment can handle. So nobody up here is advocating for this. but. Some of us are very realistic about the fact that the 40B works against communities, plain and simple. The state is in the business of ensuring that suburban communities have enough affordable housing. And they're not gonna, they're gonna ignore your zoning bylaws. So, um, that being said, what I'm looking for my other colleagues here is, do you want us to continue to, to enter into discussions with the, with the gentleman or not? You know, do you want us to continue on? Do you think it's fruitful or hopeful or anything can come out of it? Anything can happen. You know, dollars are going to drive this. The economics are going to drive everything here. And at some point, it isn't economically feasible for Mr. Yeba, and he's just going to say, forget it, I'm done talking with you, you know, and roll the dice with the state. Zoning Board of Appeals is going to make a decision. 
Yes, something go here, X number of units. Here you go. Take it or leave it. And if he says no, he's going to appeal it, then a higher authority makes that determination, and then we have no say. So there's an awful lot of risk here, and we're going to be very careful as to how we, uh, how we handle it. I, I do want to allow for uh, one, one, one last public comment, but I, I do want to address, n not, not in, I, I, I really take issue with somehow putting uh, Pulte in the equation here as the cause of this, because we already heard from the principal planner that the percentage is based on a 2010 census. We unanimously, excepting the two new members. I wasn't there then. Excepting yeah. three of us, okay. The board unanimously accepted that proposal. It was in the right location. It was an over 55 proposal. It checked off all the boxes as far as what we were looking for. This is completely different. It's in the completely wrong spot, and we know this from all these thousands of studies that we do. So Pulte was a good deal, and I cannot understand how somehow that's being put in this mix as though it somehow caused this scenario I, I'll to I'll tell occur. you exactly how it It's ridiculous. It, it's not ridiculous. You just heard we the had an opportunity. planner talk about the 2010 We had an opportunity census. to take $18.5 million instead of $30 million and have 25% of those units be affordable. And based upon the current inventory, that would have put us over the top right now, based upon the census. But you voted for so, it. In our you, initial discussions, which haven't been released yet, I was in favor of the affordable aspect of it, but I was presented and voted for a united front in signing the deal with Pulte. I think Pulte was the best proposal. Absolutely. So we need Absolutely to the move best on proposal, from saying But I'm just telling you right now, we had an opportunity. We had an opportunity and let it go. It's ridiculous. No, it's not ridiculous. It's, ridiculous. it's a matter of fact. It ticked off all the boxes in terms of what we were looking for in terms of transitioning housing in place, offering something for over 55 communities. It was still going to be an over and 55. Less, it was still less, going to be an over 55. No, it wasn't. Less dense affordable. and less impact on so. the community based on that. So, so But anyway, we so, had an opportunity and so we made a conscious decision. Totally no, but you voted for it. How can you argue that something event, you voted for? I did vote for event, it, and eventually I did. We, we, huh. do, we do want to, there was one, Mr. Saltz, why don't you give us the last public comment, please? <laughs> So three quick thoughts. The first one is, Mr. Yeba put us all in a spot. I, I celebrate really what this group did because you actually had, I think one of, the, one of you said that you had the plan in place to get us where we needed to be and he slipped in. So he has put us in a very uncomfortable position. Um, so I celebrate what you're doing. I celebrate what the ZBA is gonna be doing. You know, there are some tremendous challenges for our whole community because of what Mr. Yeba has done. Let's just be honest about it. The second thing, and I just have to respectfully disagree with one thing that you said, is that just because this has been approved for consideration, it's not approved for anything. Correct. Yeah. You know, in fact, there have been a number of 40Bs, I just want to be very clear about this, that have gotten to this point in the process and zero houses have been put in because of environmental impact. Mm -hmm. So I just want to be clear, just because he's gotten to this point, it sounded very much like you're saying we're getting something. Yeah. I just want to be clear that, that while you know, that's certainly a possibility that we all need to recognize. It's definitely not some, it's not a done deal yet. And by the way, there are a lot of us who are going to be working very hard to prove, yeah. as other communities have proved. I mean, think about the fragile place he's putting this. He's putting it right on the Ipswich River. Yeah, well, he's, he's got to spend the resources to, to exactly. prove that. Exactly. So, so, to spend the resources and I, to and, I, and I celebrate and appreciate Jeff, that, just I, to clarify your statement, I'm right here. Just to clarify you, he only was approved to file the application. That's just to make exactly sure everybody right. understands that. Right. Exactly. Yeah. You guys often say approved, and people who are watching on TV exactly. or reading in the newspaper, yeah. they hear, oh, it's done. It's on no, website. It's on website. So Correct. You've got to be right. crystal clear, and I applaud you for yep. saying Thank you. Thank you. So I think we all get that, but I do believe yeah. that the folks out there who do hear this need to understand that there approved. is a battle coming, and that battle could end up with a zero position. And quite frankly, many of us hope for that because we are so concerned about the fragile spot that he's elected to put this. That the, one of the reasons that that spot has been that way for as long as it is, is because it is a tremendously fragile spot. It was one of the reasons many, many moons ago, Mr. Woodman, he has left, uh, but one of the reasons it, that, that they allowed the, to happen, what happened was that it would protect that area, and now suddenly that area is, is becoming unprotected because of the 40B, which is the, a very good point that, you're, that you've made. The last point I'd like to make and, and you made a wonderful point over there, disingenuous. 
This is all a matter of good faith. So you ask, should you continue negotiating? I I'm always happy to negotiate, but at this point, I'm going to also be honest that the negotiation I've seen so far, and I believe that this group has seen so far, has not been in good faith, in our opinion. He makes more money with the, his alternative proposal than he made from his original proposal. I do not want to be back here again at 11.16 at night talking about the next proposal. If, he, if he's acting in good faith, I have personally no problem you talking to him, but, but understand that, that what we've seen here as a first step is nothing close to good faith. And, and I don't want to have to come back and every time be talking about are we going to be putting a, a zoning change in based on 120 units or 100 units. This has to be something that truly aligns with what our community's expectations are and, again, the very fragile place that he, is, he would like to put housing in. And that would be my, my take on it. And I thank you very thank much you. for a few moments. Thank you. Our, our hour is late, so I would like to move on with this topic and get the input of the board to give our two members some direction. Mrs. I, I just wanted a, a really quick story because I know we're all exhausted. Um, but I want you guys to be able to kind of cling to this because when I moved to town, we moved on to a dirt road. We lived in a little, very little house uh, with lots of property around us. A developer came in the reason why I have my neighbor. Um, we knew there was nothing we could do about it. The developer was coming in, but they were going to put the road right where my stairs ended. And when I said, but my children come down those stairs, and they're gonna go into a road, they said, well, watch your children. We were told there was nothing we could do about it. The only reason it changed is because we mentioned to our attorney that we had a well, and everything changed. Well, you have a well that has to be protected and the road had to move. So just cling to that. That's what you have to cling to. That's what can change everything. Okay, maybe reiterate. If I can, Jeff, Jeff, just real quick, just so you know, we don't want to have to have you guys come back here either. But again, just to reiterate, this is the only forum we can legally talk about this, the five of us. So we have to talk in it. We can't have meetings on our own at, you know, at McDonald's or Dunkin' Donuts. We have to, so we have to, every time we come back, it is going to be here. That's just I the way the structures work. I agree with you. I'm just asking you, asking you as a part of this, if, if, we're not, if you're not seeing the good faith that this, this group is sharing with you that we feel would be good faith, you know, that's not something that, that we would want. To do. I just trust you guys as my constituents think that I have your best interest in mind. I think you guys know where I personally stand on this. And... I'll be very honest with you all throughout the process that I can give you my word. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. And, and, and I would say to, to comment that I, I, I have worked with Mr. O'Leary on negotiation matters, and he's quite good at it. So I would trust in these two gentlemen to continue. Uh, it's against my better judgment, too, because, again, actions speak louder than words. In the midst of all this informal discussion, that application's filed. It moves it onto a track now. So what is that telling us? You know, but I would trust these two gentlemen in my RTA to continue that and to continue that effort forward only in my opinion, and this I'm only one out of five, because of the fact that it it is so important to all of us. All of you, all of us, the whole community, it is so important to try. And and they are in good faith trying. And I appreciate their efforts. And I know it's a lot of time. Well, we, I think I'd like to make a motion to. Well, I don't know if you need a motion other well, than direction. Just, direction. just, just a direct okay. consensus yeah, of the so. board to continue to. Right. Go, you know, to and to so. reject the 162. And, you. and is that yep. your, is that yeah. your, and, and you clearly mm -hmm. come from that. Mr. Walner, we'd like, what about you? Yeah, I just say that um, I've seen the benefit, the town has seen the benefit of continuous negotiations. And we can use Andover as a good example. No one acted in more poor good faith than Andover did for two or three years. Steve O'Leary and Bob Masseri uh, led that effort and really came up with a huge solution for us that just came by persistence. So it's not over till it's over. You always negotiate, you always go for it. Um, and I, I strongly support them and continue to do what I they I wouldn't want. mind if you said no that I'd give us a few, <laughs> a few dozen hours going <laughs> forward. All right. <laughs> But if you're willing efforts, to so. continue it, I think yeah. that that's probably the wisest course at this yeah. point. You really have nothing to lose other than the hours. Right. And Your time. Yeah. 
Yeah. The medical bills from being. And you guys are welcome to stay for our water use discussion coming up. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. But again, thank you very much for coming out. Continue your continue your good work. Continue advocating. Yes. You know you're, you're not going unheard. We applaud you yes. for being involved. Poor Mr. Clark's back there. We love there. the company. <laughs> Thanks very much. We don't usually have company. <laughs> we still, All right. We still know. <laughs> oh, where, where are we at? Okay. Hey, Tom, nice to meet you. I'm the spokesperson for my neighborhood. So as soon as you, you put up, you put up. I put it on that on your website. No, but a lot of people don't have social media. They pass it on to them. No, I, I talk. Good. Folks. Face, face, face to face. Thank you. Steve knows that too, okay. right? Face to face. Folks. <laughs> Tom, thanks for your time. <laughs> Folks, we still have uh, multiple items to get to on this agenda. Hey guys, so. we still got a meeting that we got, you guys yeah, to take out in the hallway. We're, yep. we're, on to, yep. we're on to number 10. Poor Mark. Madam Chair, I move to <laughs> declare a stage one water use restriction. Okay, and I have a motion. Do I have a second? second. And, and any discussion on the motion? Well, give them the courtesy of, a, of, a, yes. of an explanation. <laughs> no. Exactly. I, Madam Chair, I know, I, no, 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 I know the hour is late, but we do want to get word out to residents. Oh. Um. <laughs> Mr. Clark, thank you for staying here this late. It's an interesting discussion. Um, so I'm coming before you tonight. Typically, we come before you uh, earlier in the season. It's usually a May or a June type thing where we get to the point where our water demands require some type of higher level of restriction. Obviously, this was kind of an odd spring where it rained pretty much all of May and June. Um, subsequently, though, we have kind of hit the time of year where the, the hot weather combined with a lack of rain gives us some concerns that the storage tanks are starting to drop on a on a a greater basis than they did so far into the season. So we're at, I'm coming before you asking that we implement the stage one water restriction. Currently we have, it's basically just an odd even system where you can water, if you're an odd number house, you water on odd number days, even number house on even number days. Coming before you asking that we just step that up a little bit where odd numbers can water twice a week and even numbers can water twice a week based on uh, the day of the, you know, where they are, based on their house number. And that's the purpose behind the level one restriction? Correct, right. That's correct. Okay. It's, the first, it's the first step outside of the seasonal restriction. All right. And we've had it each of the past four or five years at least. I think as long as Mr. Gilberto's been here, we've probably adopted it. And actually, as Steve can probably relate it, it predates Mr. Gilberto. It's not something that he came, brought to town. But so it's a send, it's no emergency state. However, it's a conservation effort that we want to keep. And, and the place. restrictions are centered along, around lawn watering. I know lawn, that's often a question water. that comes up. Right. Can we yeah. use water okay. outside? Yeah. Yes, you can use water outside, but not for purposes for watering your lawn other than within the restrictions. Okay, so irrigation systems that people have set up, again, you're going to. This permits. Can you say that again? Because it was very noisy. Sure. Sorry about. It. So this allows lawn watering, and you'll have to forgive me if I get this wrong. But if you're an odd numbered house, it's on Tuesdays and Fridays, and if you're an even number house, it will be on Wednesdays and Saturdays now. Okay. So. Thank um, you. Any further discussion? Any questions? I, I do just want oh, to make a sorry. comment. So. I know I, I trump on this every time I'm here, but one of the benefits of the new metering system is we can actually get reports on who's watering oh. and how many days a week they're watering. So wow. surprisingly today I went in and I said, well, who's watered each of the last seven days? And you know, 63 properties in town popped up that have been watering each of the last seven days. And there were you know so many watered every six, six of the last seven. And so one of the things I would like to do is just go out with uh, some PR notification, just send a, not a, a, a fine type letter or a hammer type letter, but just a, a reminder, here are the restrictions. Last night the board voted to adopt these, and based on what we're seeing, your water use is kind of outside of those parameters, mm -hmm. so just asking people to come into compliance. Again, this is not something we're doing. There, there are fines associated with this if you read the bylaw. We're not doing it to raise money. We're doing it basically to get us to the point where we're reining in the water demands. So we're, where we are now is if it, if we get a nice thunderstorm every third day, we're great. But that's not the way to run the water system. You don't want to be relying on you know Mother Nature coming through for you. So that's that's really the thought behind this. Okay. okay. So you're looking for the seal of approval from the board to do that. 
right, it, it, you know, yeah. it does take a board and vote in order to. You may not have stayed awake until 1130 at the board meeting to know this, but this is a restriction in place, right? right. Something to that effect, mm -hmm. right? Okay, so I have a, thank you. You're Do I have a motion? Do I have a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Unanimous. Aye. Next. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. Um, is our second second reading? Second reading of the policy for um, school. There's a motion. Yes. There Madam is. Chair, I move to approve the second reading of the school district reserve fund transfers policy pursuant to MGL Chapter 40, Section 13E, and to adopt said policy. Second. I have a motion and a second. Are we going to actually read the policy? You, you can. You don't customarily. Often the policies Isn't are much longer. Is a second reading a requirement to read the policy a second time? I'm only reporting the board's custom, but you certainly are welcome to read it. <laughs> any further discussion, Kate? So, any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Unanimous. Our next uh, order of business, thank goodness we didn't have clerk staff sit here for the whole time, is the appointments and reappointments for election workers, capital improvement planning committee, and taxation <coughs> aid committee. And there is a memorandum from the town clerk. Um, that ref references the option that the board historically has elected for the disappointment and we have drafted a motion accordingly so I believe the appropriate option highlighted or bolded mm -hmm. and these are options um, yes I move is typically what we would do I move correct. to exercise the following option for appointment of election workers for elections held between September 1st 2019 through August 31st 2020 Appoint election officers from the list submitted by the registrars as recommended by the registrars. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. S motion and second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 It's unanimous. Okay. Next order. Madam Chair, I move to appoint select board member Richard Walner as liaison resident to the taxation committee for a term to expire May 5th, 2020. And I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. And thank you, Mr. Walner. <laughs> Do we have any discussion did, did on that? Did you volunteer for that? Anyone want to fight him on that one? So. <laughs> my liaison. <laughs> so, okay. So all those in favor? Aye. 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 Unanimous, Mr. Walner. Madam Chair, I move to appoint the following individual to the Capital Improvement Planning Committee, Catherine Manupelli, Select Board Rep, term to expire May 5th, 2020, Michael Connolly, School Rep, term to expire June 30th, 2022, Abigail Hurlbut, FinCom Rep, term to expire June 30th, 2022. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. A motion, a second. Any discussion? Yes, I'm not sure about that. Any penalty person. <laughs> <laughs> Me neither. <laughs> However, it's a default. I have a motion. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Unanimous. Okay. Okay, Tim. We're moving right along to our town administrative report. Did we approve all the legal bills? Yes. Yep. Tell us what's going on with the technical issues. <laughs> oh, what's what's wrong? Um, Amazing to fix everything. Yeah, I, I was able to fix it partially and then not totally. So um, I apologize for the technical issues and the board's understanding tonight, and particularly for the community members who were subjected to the delay. So. Um, Thank you. So just a couple of notes that I'll provide um, for the board. First, uh, Youth Substance Abuse Grant Coordinator Amy Luckowitz and Detective Paul Lucci participated in a Rotary-sponsored school resource officer vocational training in the United Kingdom last month. The training focused on substance abuse prevention policies, substance abuse treatment and prevention strategies, mental health approaches in substance abuse prevention, youth-based justice community building strategies, troubled family intervention initiatives, and diversion strategies. Thank you, Mr. O'Leary. 
The trip was paid for by the Rotary Fo Foundation of Rotary International, and I provided a report that was prepared by Ms. Luckwitz and Officer Lucci uh, for the board's reference, and uh, hopefully you had an opportunity to review through it. I, and I want to thank uh, Amy and Paul for their uh, participation and also for their efforts to make sure a full report was provided on their travels. Second, as you know, I participated in the screening as candidates for the superintendent of schools. Three finalists were forwarded to the school committee at the end of the screening, and assistant superintendent of schools, Patrick Daly, was selected by the school committee. I thank the school committee for the opportunity to participate in the process, and I also wish to acknowledge the dedicated and efficient work of the members of the committee, which was chaired by school committee member Janine Imbriano. Third, as of June 17, 2019, all businesses, including licensed food establishments in North Reading, are prohibited from producing, manufacturing, advertising, offering, or selling any food or other consumable product that contains CBD. And I uh, attached a copy of an advisory that was issued by the Board of Health. Some of the board members know that this was a discussion that we had last summer uh, when we first became aware of its presence here in the community. Um, at that time, we reported that our ability to regulate it was significantly uh, hindered, if not non-existent. Since then, there's been some interpretation and, and uh, guidance that's come out from the State Department of Public Health, which has caused our Board of Health to take the appropriate action uh, over the last few weeks. I wish to welcome Sean O'Hearn as a maintenance craftsman in the Water Department. Sean brings a, a wide variety of general construction and grounds maintenance knowledge and skill. He has prior municipal and private sector experience and possesses his hoisting license commercial driver's license and several safety certifications. I attached a copy of correspondence that, sent out, that was sent out by my office regarding the upcoming October town meeting. I'll just note that the deadline for submission of articles is 4 o'clock p.m. on Monday, August 19th. Uh, as we discussed earlier, the ZBA did receive a Chapter 40B housing development application. I attached a copy of the town planner's correspondence with the various uh, departments, boards, and committees to which the application was required to be routed under the law and also in accordance with the ZBA's policies. More just to let you know that we are following through with uh, what our obligations are um, for circulating the, uh, the application, which we were, were required to do within seven days of its filing. Elaborate on the development. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're all well aware. Um, as a follow up to an item that was brought up at the last meeting, uh, the superintendent of schools, parks director, school facility staff, and I met with representatives of youth softball on June 18th in the superintendent's office. Uh, it was a productive conversation with softball identifying specific issues of concern at a couple of the fields. An action plan was developed and we agreed to reconvene in August to evaluate our progress toward that plan. I think we all walked out of the meeting um, with a better understanding of some of the needs and some of the challenges and with a good uh, action plan moving forward. And finally, this wasn't in my written report, but I do want to make the board aware that there um, uh, has been some contact that, that I have received from some of the cellular um, service providers that have um, uh, radio equipment located and, and the antennas located on our water towers. Some of the board members know that uh, I was approached regarding one of them uh, earlier this year. Uh, for two of the board members to be aware, I do live close to one of the water towers, so I filed a, a disclosure with the board in which the board authorized me to continue to act on the town's behalf. Um, but what is coming is that there will be some administrative work for us relative to some of the existing leases for the towers. Um, some will be looking to extend their leases, others may be looking to, um, to enter into new leases under different terms which may or may not require a procurement process and I'll continue to keep the board apprised as that process unfolds over the next few months. And that concludes my comments and again Mr. O'Leary, thank you. Much better than reading off of my phone. Any <laughs> questions for the TA? <coughs> All right, so thank we put, um, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gilberto. We put board members' reports and old and new business together at the end, figuring that you can each have a turn to address both. It's kind of the same thing. <laughs> All right, we just took it out of order because we had figured with the 40B that, and we were correct, that there may be perhaps a number of uh, residents that might want to speak to that topic. So, Mr. O'Leary. A uh, couple of things. One, I just want to acknowledge the passing of a couple of our residents, um, Charlie Piscatelli and, uh, and Tony Mack, uh, both of them uh, long active members of, uh, of our community. And uh, you know, Charlie was very active over in the uh, Martins Pond area, Clark Park, and while he never served on the town board's bid commissions, uh, he was very active in the community, very active in 
Martin's Pond area, uh, instrumental in ensuring that Clark Park was redeveloped, but also uh, was involved uh, with other uh, local organizations, uh, which uh, did a lot of charitable work, and it's uh, unfortunate uh, to announce his passing. Again, Tony Mack, another gentleman who, uh, along with his wife Dolores, again, contributed uh, substantially uh, to the town of North Reading, served on the Conservation Commission here when uh, they were much more active than they are these days uh, in the years when development was um, significant and that, uh, you know, his efforts, uh, people today are, are enjoying uh, the type of community we have now because of people like Tony. And again, uh, condolences to Tony and uh, Tony's family, uh, Dolores and his daughter Jody, uh, also was uh, secretary to our board for a while. Uh, but anyway, uh, great members of the community and uh, sorry to hear of their passing. And on a brighter note, uh, congratulations to Leanne's daughter, becoming a state trooper, to you and your husband. Congratulations on, I'm sure, Thank greatly you, assisting her uh, to get through the, the academy, which was no simple task. And uh, I'm sure you're very proud of her, and congratulations. Thank you. Right. That's it. I'm sure. Thank you. Just a quick question. I, I just wanted some, we had discussed with EDC, or EDC had made a question with regard to sewer agenda and where we're at with those. And in the past when we've discussed that, we've, we've been discussing the permitting process. So I took from the response that was presented today that when we say we're in permitting process with the end over that, that only pertains to their expansion of what they're providing to us or getting permission to expand. You're talking about the water or sewer? I, that's what I'm asking oh. you. So we're not actually in any permitting phasing or any kind of development of moving forward with the Andover on sewerage at this we point? We have a long way to go in the sewerage stuff. I mean, the water thing, again, I can defer to the town administrator, but, you know, we need a significant amount of information from Andover in response to the uh, FEIR filing. Some residents up there filed some concerns, and now the state is requiring Andover to address those concerns in writing and uh, remedial plans as to how they're handling it, how they're going to handle it. And that affects our ability in the uh, FEIR filing process. So um, that's where we're at. So as far as the... But that doesn't pertain to sewerage at all. No, then. That's, that's, that's where the water. That but that's where their efforts are, are concentrated and where they're going to be put for the next several months. Uh, they've indicated that they just don't have the time resources right now to devote much towards the uh, sewerage. So um, what are we doing to sort of pursue that? Because under the agreement, they, they we still have do they have to have that? In other words, does that have to be squared away first? I know that we were in a permitting process to expand the number of gallons per day they were providing us under the terms of the agreement. So. So is that what the what we're in right now? Have we been already approved for that and the expansion of that, or are we waiting to get that approved? We're, we're waiting, but again, we're also waiting. Part of this whole process is we still have to find a location on Route 28 for the chlorination plant as part of the, part of the filing. Mm -hmm. We have to have a location, and we're still in negotiations with a couple of different parties trying to bring that to, to closure. So as far as what we need to do here locally, that's the... That's, the big issue that we have to address from our end. The rest of it's in Andover's hands right now. We have our consultants consulting with their consultants. We have our DPRW director talking with their DPRW director, our town administrator talking with their town manager, and trying to help facilitate all these um, things as far as the water goes. You know, the, the rest of it is in the agreement, the 99 year agreement, Andover agreed to help assist us in trying to integrate a lot of sewer. Mm -hmm. There was no timeline associated with that. Part of the uh, FEIR process, we have to discuss wastewater and what we're planning on doing and how we're going to go get there, but it's further down the road. Okay. Thank you. Greg? Yeah. Greg? Okay. Okay. Mr. Any, anything else, Mr. O'Leary? Nope. Okay. Mr. Walner. Okay. Um, uh, Regarding liaisons, I've introduced myself to everybody. I've offered to participate, support, whatever. <coughs> I've been to the Cable Advisory Board meeting, um, you know, I'll participate as they invite me in. I'll try to do that. But anyways, I wanted to skip to, um, I prepared this, and I don't know if I can hand it out or not, but um, as we saw tonight, you, have, you know, uh, 
CPC, we have EDC, you know, we had a, one representative from the facilities master planning committee. Um, we have our own opinions. Um, I, I dug into my library stuff and dug out how Stoneham Center put together their thing. And what happened in the end is as you read through this, and I'll, I think this is fine to hand out to everybody. Of course. This, of course. You can read this later, but just in general, it describes the project and it actually has many parallels to what we're doing right now. But on the back side, what you learn is that the select board, their select board started feeling out of control because they didn't take the lead. And it was a question of who's, who's on first and who's not on first. And tonight we saw a perfect example of that, is that individual areas have their, their concerns, but they're not necessarily the same concerns we have, I'm trying to put this whole story together. And so what I'm proposing, and I did a draft proposal of this, is I'm kind of outlining what I think that we should be stepping up. Here's the three main things, sewerage, facilities, um, and uh, downtown. And because at the end of the day, it's gonna end up in our lap, we have to really sort out fact from opinion, because we even heard that tonight, where are we with sewage? You know, it's a lot of opinions, but not facts. We need to have facts. And at the end of the day, we're gonna be taking in this information. We have to put a plan together we don't have the resources to do everything, so we're going to have to allocate and properly um, create synergy that's going to give us the most bang for our buck for what we have to do, um, and I think it's going to fall on us. And so I think we're kind of missing the boat to be sitting here and, you know, as I heard the facilities master plan talk about how sites have never been mentioned. If you actually read the second page, they actually talk about sites for some of the things inside there. So their own, again, with good intentions, people can get caught up in things that we would like to see cleaned up. And so I'm proposing that somebody or a representative from within this group helps participate in coordinating this activity going forward. And I'd like you to just think about that, if nothing else. So is it okay to hand this Absolutely. out? Absolutely. And then we can discuss it Absolutely. next time. I don't think it has to yeah. be done today. I think we solved a lot tonight. But um, I do see this as a continuing project. And again, at the end of the day, you're gonna have all this information. How do you sort it out? And I don't want to be sitting here looking at the wrong information, bad information, or just we don't have complete information. Right? We should have as much complete information right. as we possibly can. I mean, that, what's in the packet tonight, which was in the packet last meeting, was the RFP for that um, master facilities planning yeah. study, which I thought was very good, all inclusive and very comprehensive very clear about what they're looking to study. I, I don't, I thought it was excellent. So yeah, it was just on the back page when she talked about the sites, it actually, she said sites should matter, but on the back side it actually talks about mm -hmm. sites. So there's one paragraph that we actually need to massage or need to review with her, um, whoever's the lead of that. And well, we talked about this at the last meeting and those sites are town owned, right? Town owned property. Uh, so we talked about it in the context right. of incorporating. Right. So that's, I mean, these are yeah. discussion points, right? So mm -hmm. when I read through that, as soon as I saw that, I was like, oh, we have to spend some time. I put a big circle around it. We need to discuss this paragraph. But then the perception was from that own committee is that, oh, yeah, we don't, we're, we're not looking at sites. But in fact, it's there. So right now it's there under its current proposal. So what I'm saying is all this stuff needs mm -hmm. to be worked mm -hmm. through. Mm -hmm. And I think we all... Tonight, I think we resolve a lot about how we look at it. So I'll just hand this out while yeah, you do this. Sure, you can read it later, sure. okay? And comment back to me anytime you want. Thank you. Yeah. Pass me down. And I may not be 100% accurate. But go ahead, continue. I'll pass it out. Don't, don't, you don't have to look at it now. Do it later. It's way too late. Did you have anything else you wanted to no, that, discuss? No, that's, that's okay. a primary thing. Thank you. Yeah. That's great. Um, Any other comments? No, the only other thing I'll say is that, you know, um, I, when we are putting out social media and stuff like that, I think it's really important we say, this is news, facts, and this is opinion. And if it all it said is just news, and it's all factual, that's great. And, and then if we have an opinion, it's opinion. But they're really separated out. Because people can get... I think we might be... I know we're working on that. Not okay under open meeting law to, to put an opinion out about something that is actively oh, okay. I don't know about that. our business to deliberate. Yeah. I yeah. think we have, if it's a press release or informational, he has an update on something, that's fine. But I think because I'm going to see your stuff and probably Steve will, and at least a quorum of us is going to see one another's <laughs> stuff. So we might want to steer away from, I know when Mr. Schultz posts, he steers away from 
giving it as an opinion unless it's a particular. I post the food agenda. Or, or, yeah. yeah, no, I, I love the facts. I mean, I, yeah. I look forward to We need to have a town page. Facebook page. I've been saying that for a while. Yeah, we've talked yeah. about that. All right, ready? Yes. Mr. First, Schultz. Thank first, you, Mr. Walner. Mr. Uh, Schultz. Again, congratulations to Mr. Patrick Daly on being our new superintendent. Um, look forward to working with him. Also, Parks and Rec and LUC have combined. There's a new Reed's Ferry shed where the town barbecues are. It has electricity. It's got a lot of storage. Looks really nice. It's right in IRP. And it is fully operational. And the town barbecues are going on Wednesday night. Come down and support Parks and Rec. Thank you. This is Gonzalez. Um, I would just like to talk about um, the wall that heals that is going to be coming to North Reading to Ipswich River Park um, being put on with, by the veterans, um, the North Reading Veterans Group. Um, it's going to be a pretty cool thing. Uh, it's going on from August 15th to the 18th and before that they they do need volunteers to set up, to take down. They need people there um, 24 hours uh, with the wall. So they do need a lot of volunteers. It's quite a project that they're taking on and uh, I think it's gonna be a really great thing. So I just wanted to bring awareness to that. You can go on to their website or social media or contact Sue Magner if you'd like to volunteer. Thank you, anything else? Good. I'll just say to thank the residents, Mr. Stoltz, for still hanging in there with us at the quarter of 12 hour. You get a gold star. Thank you mm. but to the residents for coming You're and making, 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 right. making their positions mm. known. I know it's a rather late meeting. Believe it or not, we shifted things to the next meeting and took them off the agenda oh, so we gosh. could accommodate this. But when things are of that nature, that's when people come out. Usually we're, we are all by ourselves. So um, listening to ourselves, and we're the only ones listening. So thank, thank the residents for showing up and just to appreciate their feedback on the things that we are doing. It helps us too and informs what we do as well. So it's important for us to hear from people too at these forums, so. Yeah. Um, and then congratulations to you too, because you had an addition to the oh, law right. enforcement realm right. and congratulations to you on your daughter too. Your son yes, and your Kevin. daughter. Yep. State yeah. police, right? Yes. Yeah. Oh, Boston. 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 We got, we got it covered. We got the state and we got Boston. <laughs> no, yeah, I don't think so. Son is this? <laughs> Mr. O'Leary's son. Kevin. Yeah, that's, that's good. This is a good achievement when parents are able to get their <laughs> kids off the payroll. Children into the <laughs> law enforcement field. So congratulations to both of you. All I right. Think I had congratulated you right afterwards. Just so okay. One and not. You did. <laughs> so I yes. Till next 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 meeting. For a second. <laughs> Anyone second. second. All, All right. those in favor. Aye. Yes. Goodbye.